Good evening. It being 6 p.m. on the 6th of March, 2023, in the town of Richmond, Vermont, I call this 228th annual town meeting to order. Would you all please stand as the Boy Scouts from Troop 23 present the colors and the Pledge of Allegiance. Color Guard, attention. Color Guard, forward march. Color Guard, halt. Color Guard, cross the colors. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Father God, post the colors. Color Guard, retrieve. Would you all please join me in a moment of silence to honor those that have served or are currently serving in the armed forces to protect the freedoms that we have today. Thank you. You may be seated. I'd like to uh, first turn the microphone over to uh, our town clerk, Linda Perrin, who has a special presentation. May I ask at this time for Elizabeth and Malachi Urbanic to come to the stage? For those of you uh, that knew Jeff Urbanic, we were very lucky and blessed to have him work with us for eight years as town manager. Um, he got an awful lot accomplished. Then he left us to go to Colchester, and they also loved him very much. Um, I spoke to several of the people from the town clerk's office, and um, they did tell me that their gain was our loss. Um, and I'd like to give you this town report in honor of Jeff, who we will always have in our hearts. start before we start the meeting. Um, if we have any first-time voters joining us today, would you please stand and be recognized? Any first-time voters? Yes, there we go. Welcome to democracy. Okay, some house rules. Uh, there's no food nor drink in the gymnasium. And please turn off your cell phones so we're not interrupted by that. I would like to go over some procedures that have been in use for some time, but since we've had a bit of a hiatus for the last two years, they do bear repeating. So we're all on the same page. The meeting will be conducted using Robert's Rules of Order, except we're superseded by Vermont state law. In all remarks, 
for motions should be directed to me, the moderator. Remarks are to be confined to the merits of the question. Our, all articles must be moved, seconded, and restated by the moderator before discussion can begin. All motions and amendments are to be made in the affirmative. Non-voters may not speak except by suspension of the rules, which requires a two-thirds vote in the affirmative. I will try to anticipate this by asking for common consent. This may include um, town employees or other non-residents who may have expertise to lend. Again, non-voters may not void, excuse me, may not vote by voice nor by any other means. If this becomes a problem, we'll have to uh, figure out some way to segregate uh, everybody to that such that their voice cannot be part of a deliberation. Voting on an article will be um, primarily by voice vote, but we can do it by um, a division of the house, by hand or by standing. And if necessary or the uh, assembled desire, we can have a paper ballot at any time we wish, providing seven voters call for that ballot. This is as described in Vermont state statutes. All articles can be amended, and that amendment can be amended once. I would ask the maker of an amendment to present it in writing, such that it can be read to the assembly. Please make any amendments in the affirmative in such a way that is clear and succinct. Ensure any amendments are germane to the original article, that it does not substantially change the intent. We do, we have a warned, um, there, there's a warning and, and it's not fair to those that are here if, we, if the subject is not germane to the, uh, to the warned article. There's no re-vote on an article once we have declared the vote and the next article is announced. Now a word on Australian ballot items, and this is important because it's a little confu more confusing this year than in past. Uh, a, a change in state law back in 2008 allows discussion of worn articles at town meeting with the exception for voting on town or school officials. And just be all reminded that the Australian ballot, although we can discuss them tonight, Australian ballot voting will happen tomorrow morning when the poll is open for the day. If, you, if we desire to um, discuss a Australian ballot an item, um, I will ask for a motion to discuss the article. We can have the discussion and I will ask for the, a motion to cease discussion. And this way, you are all making the choice on whether to, to discuss this article. When the moderator recognizes you, please stand and state your name for the minutes. There are two scouts that will be roaming around with a couple of microphones. Uh, and, uh, we will do our best to, uh, to get them to where you're at. The maker of the motion has a right to speak first. And then citizens have the opportunity to speak twice on a motion, providing uh, everyone's had their chance to, to speak the first time around. And Robert's Rules does provide a time limit of 10 minutes on a speaker, so if needed, I will remind the speaker of the elapsed time. Regarding calling the question, traditionally in the town of Richmond, we allow the courtesy that all who wish to speak once get to do so. You must be recognized to speak by the moderator if you want to call the question. All discussion then must cease, and it does require a two-thirds majority uh, in, in order to um, cease debate. And under the last article, well, I'll get to that in a second, uh, but there, there is an article where resolutions and other non-binding non articles can be discussed. I would ask if you have those, please put those in writing and bring them forward so we can uh, 
we can announce those. There are co copies of the town report if you desire up front here. And we are um, on camera this evening by MMC TV. And with that, um, I will now ask the town clerk in which to read the warning. Thank you. The official warning, the annual town meeting, March 6th and 7th, 2023, Richmond, Vermont. The legal voters of the town of Richmond, Vermont, and the legal voters of the Mount Mansfield Unified Union School District residing in Richmond, Vermont, are hereby notified and warned to meet at Campbell's Hub Middle School in said town on Monday, March 6, 2023 at 6 p.m. to transact the following business from the floor. Must be present in person to vote on Articles 1 through 3. Article 1 to hear and accept the reports of the town officers. Article 2, shall the voters of the town of Richmond approve a budget of $4,530,571 to meet the expenses and liabilities of the town of Richmond. Article 3, to transact any other town business that may come legally before this meeting. The legal voters of the town of Richmond and the legal voters of Mount Mansfield Unified School District living in Richmond are further warned to meet at Campbell's Hunt Middle School in said town on Tuesday, March 7, 2023, where the polls will be open at 7 a.m. in the forenoon and close at 7 p.m. in the afternoon to vote on the following articles by Australian ballot. Article 4. Shall general obligation bonds or notes of the town of Richmond in an aggregate amount not to exceed $1,900,000 subject to reduction by available state and federal grants and aid and other financial assistance to fund the replacement of water lines and related appurtenance along Tilden Avenue, approximately 1,305 linear feet, along portions of Cochrane Road, approximately 1,615 linear feet, and along a portion of Bridge Street, approximately 775 linear feet. Article 5, shall the voters to approve the funding, the Conservation Reserve Fund, by adding one cent to the municipal tax rate for the 2023-2024 physical year, and six, to elect town and school officers for terms posted on the ballot. And this is approved and signed by our select board, June Heston, David Sander, Jay Fur, Bart Hill, and Jeff Forward. Thank you. Article one, to hear and accept the town, to hear and accept reports of the town officers. What would you like to do with Article 1? This is where someone would make a motion. Move the article, please. The, the article has been moved to the floor. Marshal Paulson, is there a second? We're going over a second. There is a second. Article 1, to hear and accept reports of the town officers. At this point in time, uh, this, this would be uh, any questions that anyone might have regarding the reports that have been outlined in the town report. This would be a time in which to ask those questions. Seeing none, any commentary from here? Okay. We have someone? Yeah. Right here? Can we get a microphone, please?
It's been a couple of years since we've had this, so I've been working out the bugs. All right. Thank you. My name is Kathleen Gent, and I think that uh, there may be a typo on page 30. There are two tables, delinquent tax report collected as of 6-30-22, and delinquent tax report outstanding as of 6-30-22. And at the bottom of, of each of the uh, tables, total Total, uh, the first one says total outstanding, and the second one says total collected. And I believe that the those are reversed, so that the total out, total uh, collected should be with the first table, and total total outstanding with the second table. Although I'm not, I'm not certain, but I just want to bring it to your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments on that? I don't believe our delinquent tax collector is here this evening. Yeah. Kathleen, could you, uh, again, just for Linda's yeah. purposes, could you, could you uh, tell us a table? Uh, it's on page 30. Right. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, we'll get to that microphone. Yeah, sure so the, the top table uh, is for collected delinquent tax, and the second table is for outstanding delinquent tax, but the, the total lines on each table don't seem to correspond with the correct table. So it, it would appear that the, the first table should say the bottom total collected, and then the second table total should say total outstanding. Thank you for pointing that out. There seems to be some acknowledgement that that, that that is mislabeled, and we'll uh, um, we'll get back with uh, Lori regarding that. Thank you, Kathy. Any other questions on any of the reports? Okay, seeing none, um, I don't need to have a vote on this, so we'll just move on to Article Article 2. <coughs> article 2, shall the voters of the town of Richmond approve a budget of $4,530,571 to meet the expenses and liabilities of the town of Richmond? What would you like to do with Article 2? Move Article 2. Marshall Paulson has moved it. Is there a second? Mary Thank you. It's been seconded. I'll restate the article. Shall the voters of the town of Richmond approve a budget of $4,530,571 to meet the expenses and liabilities of the town of Richmond? At this time, it is uh, traditional that we have a um, short presentation by the uh, by Mr. Arneson. Would you like to take that on now? <coughs> you need my microphone. Thank you, Clint. Thank you, Linda. My name is Josh Arneson. I'm the town manager here in Richmond. Um, I'm going to do a budget presentation to go through some items on the budget. Uh, after that, we can have some questions of myself and the select board, any questions that might come up for the budget. So the budget process actually starts in probably September or October of each year as we start to go through each department's budget with the department heads in September. And we schedule a meeting in October with the select board. So I'd like to thank first all the department heads and staff that put the time into looking at last year's budget, looking at the actuals, and then working on the budget for the coming year. Then it goes to the select board and we have a meeting in October, a meeting in November, and a meeting in December. And based on their feedback, go back, make changes to the budget, 
find new things, add things in, take things out. We also heard from the public at that time, so I'd like to thank the select board for their diligence and attention to the budget throughout those months, uh, as well as the public that joined us for those meetings to help provide feedback to get us to this point where we're at today. Uh, joining us this evening, in addition to the select board, we have some department heads here, so finance director Connie Bona, uh, road foreman Pete Goslin, interim police chief Benjamin Herrick, and I think I saw Dennis Schuyler, our fire chief over there, Dennis. So we do have some department heads here this evening. If there are any real in-depth questions that we get into, it's always good to have the experts here to help answer those questions. So thank you all for participating this evening. Of course, it's got to get warmed back up. You know, not doing this for two years. I it does, that. yeah, you got to get back into it, right? Hey, Josh. Yes. Can you cheat the screen a little bit this Is it way? that way? It's kind of on. Turn it that way. Towards this way? Us. Tell me when. That's good. Why is that not? It's coming up. Yeah, but it's not at the right. Why is it not? It's going to get brighter. All right, there we go. Let's see, we need to. Okay. Why don't you just slide it that way? This right? Yeah, like six <laughs> inches. All right. How's that for you, Ruth? Is that good? That looks good. All right. We are ready for TV. The TV timeout is over. And here we go. Okay, so for tonight's agenda, we're going to review the FY24 budget. I've put some page numbers here, so if you've got your town report, you can hopefully help follow along a little bit. So in the town report, you'll find the budget on pages 11 through 22. Then we'll talk about municipal operations. We'll review reserves and unassigned and restricted funds. We'll have a slide about debt service. We'll look at the review of the budget by department, and then we'll open the floor for questions. So I'd like to start out with some of the basics just to make sure that we're all essentially on the same page with where we're, what we're talking about. So first thing is fiscal years, which can sometimes get a little confusing if you're not thinking about them every day. So the previous fiscal year was fiscal year 22. That started on July 1st, 2021, and ended on June 30th, 2022. The current fiscal year is FY23. So that started this past July and will end at the end of this coming June, 2023. And then the budget that's being voted on tonight is the FY24 budget. This will begin July 1st, 2023, and run for the year until next June 30th, 2024. I also want to talk at the outset about reserve funds and unassigned and restricted funds. As you'll see, that when we go through the budget, we talk about the total spend this year versus last year, how that affects the tax rate. These are a couple of topics that come in that factor very heavily and very importantly. So reserve funds, they function like savings accounts. Um, so the town uses them to put away money for larger capital purchases. So think of a dump truck. We might put away some money each year to build up to the purchase of that dump truck. Unassigned and restricted funds are essentially the surplus that we have at the end of each year. So there might be some funds where we, or some departments where maybe they weren't fully staffed for that year, but they were budgeted for. So there's excess revenue that came in over what we spent in expenses. There's also, sometimes we get a grant mid-budget mid, mid year that will go towards a budgeted expense and help us reduce what our expenses are. And other times there's uh, revenue from non-tax sources that's higher than budgeted. So those sometimes build up to become unassigned and restricted funds, <clears throat> which is surplus. And the difference between unassigned and restricted is that the unassigned funds are from any department except for highway, and they can be used in the future for any department, including highway. Restricted funds are surplus in the highway department that is <clears throat> restricted to only use in the highway, that's per Vermont statute. So if you raise taxes for a highway expense, it has to be used for a highway expense, even if it's not used in that fiscal year, it has, it's restricted to highway. So taking a look at our FY23 budget, spending is actually down by $566,000, or about 11%. And you can see this on page 19 of the report, which looks at the sort of bottom line of the budget. Very right at the bottom of page 19, you'll see last year's spending to this year's spending. The 566 isn't in there, but you can see the two totals from 23 to 24. By section, the general fund is down about $176,000. That's on page 17. There's totals in the bottom of that page. 
The highway fund is down about $389,000, page 19. I know we're bouncing around a little bit on this, but uh, just to try to keep you oriented to where it is in the budget. So the interesting thing here is that while expenses are down, there is a 3.67% increase in the tax rate. And you'll find the tax rate total on page 21. So of course the obvious question is, well, spending's down, why are taxes going up? So we'll get into that and explain that next. So the way that we have accounted for using uh, reserve funds has changed a bit. In previous fiscal years, if we were going to say use $50,000 in a reserve fund to buy a, a truck, we would put $50,000 on the expense side and $50,000 offsetting revenue from that reserve fund on the revenue side. So essentially, it would have no, no effect on the tax rate because we were using reserves to offset that. This year, through the budgeting process, the select board asked us to remove those so that we're not uh, adding things in that we know we're not raising taxes for directly. So you'll see on page 20, uh, sorry, on page 22, we've added a supplemental piece to the, to the budget, to the town report, that shows the planned use of reserve funds in fiscal year 24. So you'll see, and we'll get into exactly what those are a little bit later in the presentation, but that'll give you a sense of what are we planning to purchase in 24. So if we look at uh, that page, you'll see $81,250 is planned out of the general fund and $153,000 is planned for highway from reserves. So if these expenses were included in the FY24 budget, uh, the expenses would be a bit higher in the general fund, which would bring us up to $95,000 less than FY23, whereas right now the budget as presented shows the general fund down 176. A uh, highway would be $236,000 less than 23, and the budget as presented shows it down $389,000. So the, com the combined total would go to about $332,000 less than the previous year. Uh, right now in the budget, we're showing $566,000. So if we added those reserve fund purchases in as we have in previous years, we still wouldn't be quite over, we'd still be less than the previous year. So that's part of the explanation. So this chart shows um, the total expenses between FY23 and FY24. In FY23, we had total expenses of about $5 million. In FY24, it's at about $4.5 million. So the first line underneath that that you see is the reserve funds. And as we mentioned last year, we kept those items in the budget and offset them with reserves. So what we needed to raise from taxes in FY23 was about $289,000 less. So we subtract that from the total expenses. <coughs> then we just talked about unassigned and restricted funds. In FY23, we used $919,000 of combined unassigned and restricted funds to reduce the budget. This year, we're using $500,000 to reduce the tax, uh, the tax burden. So we use more restricted, more unassigned and restricted in FY23 than we are in 24. So that's contributing again to uh, having offset taxes more in the previous fiscal year. Then we get the non-tax revenue. So these are things like state aid, grants that we get from the state, um, parking tickets, things like that. So we, those remain about even from FY23 to FY24. We were budgeted at $445,000 in FY23 and about $460,000 in 24. So where this gets us is last year from taxes, we needed to raise about $3.4 million after we factored out the other revenue sources. And in FY24, we're at about $3.5 million. So about $127,000 more that needs to be raised for taxes in FY24 than we did in FY23. So that brings us to our tax rate. And you can find the tax rate again on page 21. There's a chart that shows how we calculate the tax rate. So the municipal tax rate increased from 0.7164 to 0.7427 for a total increase of 0.0263 per $100 of property value. So this is a 3.67% increase in the tax rate over FY23. So I want to make a note too about the tax rate and how we're looking at it uh, as the increase over last year and how we'll talk about it in the next few slides. So this is all based on a grand list value, and right now we're using the same grand list value to estimate the tax rate for FY24 that we're using for the actual tax rate in FY23. 
Uh, typically, the grant list changes year to year, but it's usually based on new construction or specific properties changing value. This year, we will be completing a two-year process for reappraisal. So that means that essentially every property in town will have a new value and our grand list stands to change significantly. So I don't have a projection for that. So everything that we're looking for here is kind of apples to apples on the grand list to say if everything remained the same, where would we be? Likely the grand list will go up, the tax rate might go down, but the total amount of money that we're gonna be needing to raise, which was, uh, we'll go back, the total amount, which is 3.5 million, that will not change. It'll just change about how much per hundred thousand dollars in property value you have to pay. All right. So then, looking at the tax rate increase, what does that mean in a dollar value? And again, keeping the grand list constant. So per hundred thousand dollars of property value, it's about twenty-six dollars and twenty-nine cents if the grand list were to stay constant. $200,000 in property value, the rate will go up by $52.58. $300,000 in property value, the rate goes up by $78.87. And $400,000 in property value, the rate goes up by $105.15. So then looking at your total tax bill per $100,000 of property value uh, in FY24, you would be at $742 for $100,000 in property. That's up from 716 in FY23. 200,000 goes from 1433 to 1486. $300,000 goes from 2149 to 2228. And $400,000 goes from 2866 to 2971. Next, we're going to talk about the Conservation Reserve Fund. Uh, you'll find that under the Recreation Budget on page 17. And you'll notice that in FY23, there's a number in there of, I think, about $45,000 because it was funded last year. And this year, in the budget as presented for FY24, we have not included the Conservation Reserve Fund. That's because the allocation for the Reserve Fund will be voted on by Australian ballot tomorrow. The question on the ballot is to approve funding the Conservation Reserve Fund by adding one cent to the municipal tax rate in FY24. So that estimated contribution based on the current grant list, if it passes, would be $48,305 added to the budget to go to the Conservation Reserve Fund. If it does pass, the actual amount that is raised will be dependent upon the new grant list value, which will be determined later this spring. So if the grand list value goes up, that price, or the amount that actually is contributed will go up because it will still remain at $10 per $100,000 of value of property. So if that were to be passed <clears throat> tomorrow, and if the grand list stayed the same, that would take our tax increase from 3.67 to 5.07% increase from FY23 to FY24. So a good way to illustrate that is to look at, well, with $100,000 in property value, right now the budget is calling for a $26.29 rate increase. It would add $10 per $100,000 in value, so you would end up at $36.29 if the Conservation Reserve Fund passes. Now note, you're only adding $10 per $100,000 for the Conservation Reserve Fund. $36.29 takes into account what the base budget calls for, plus the Conservation Reserve Fund at $10. At $200,000, it adds $20 to the tax rate, so that goes up to $72.58. At $300,000, it adds $30, so the change is $108.87. And at $400,000, it adds $40 to get to $145.15. So this would be the new tax bill with both the current budget as presented and the conservation budget voted in. $100,000 in property value would pay $753. $200,000 would pay $1,505. $300,000 in property value pays $2,258. And $400,000 in property value pays $3,011. This is an important slide to keep in mind that the budget that we're voting on for the town is only about 30% of your total property bill. The other 70% is the school budget, which I believe is also being voted on tomorrow, right? School budget tomorrow? Yes. 
Yeah. So the school budget will also be voted on tomorrow, but that, that's separate from the town budget. It's being voted on tonight. So this is a look at our town budgets over the last, um, I guess, 13 years. Um, we've sort of slowly sloped upward. You can see that in 23, we did have a bit of a spike, and now we've come back down. Um, a large amount of that is we have bought three large pieces of highway equipment in 23 that were included in the budget, even though they were offset by, by use of reserve and unassigned funds. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But if you look at the general slope, we're, we're continuing to increase the spending, I think, appropriately as we continue to evaluate the budget each year, look at the cost of goods and where we need to be. This is a chart that shows the allocation by department. Uh, highway is about 41%, followed by administration at 17%. Police is at 16%. Fire is at 9%. Library, 7% of the overall budget. Planning and zoning is at 6%. Charitable contributions is at 2%. The assessors is at uh, 1%. And recreation, also at 1%. So now we're going to talk a bit about what each department does, just to give everybody a little overview of um, what everybody is up to for staffing for the town. So the clerk administration and finance, this is largely the administrative budget, consists of one full-time town manager, a finance director, a town clerk, a part-time assistant town clerk, a 30-hour per week assistant to the town manager. This department operates very closely to manage revenue, payments, payroll, policies, projects, and more. The police are budgeted for one full-time chief, one full-time sergeant, three full-time officers, three per diem officers, and one part-time administrative assistant. Both the chief and the sergeant are also budgeted to be working shifts as officers, and the three per diem officers are budgeted to work on average two to four shifts per month. I know a lot of you know that we're currently short-staffed in policing. We don't currently have this level of staffing right now. This is what the budget calls for and what the budget has called for for the past few years. The fire department is budgeted at one chief, one assistant chief, three captains, one lieutenant, and 12 firefighters. It's a volunteer department, but the, office, or the firefighters do get paid for hours that they are at training or on calls. Planning and zoning has one full-time director of planning and zoning and one full-time zoning administrator. They're involved with issuing permits, re reviewing and rewriting zoning regulations, staffing for the Planning Commission and the Development Review Board, and to assist other committees related to planning as needed. The Highway Department consists of one full-time foreman, one full-time assistant foreman, four full-time drivers and operators. In the winter, they are plowing the highways, maintaining equipment, and planning their summer work. In the summer, they're very involved with gravel road maintenance, maintaining highway equipment, highway drainage work, maintaining recreational facilities, larger sidewalk and stormwater projects. And one change that happened last year was uh, we took a lot of the recreation duties out of that department and in place we're hiring an outside contractor to do a lot of the mowing of the parks and this allows the highway department to focus on some larger sidewalk and stormwater projects that otherwise would have been outsourced to a contractor and by being able to do it in-house with staff and expertise in-house actually saves us hundreds of thousands of dollars over what it would cost to sub those out to a contractor. And Pete has a really good plan of projects that he wants to work on over the next three or four summers. The Richmond Library has a full-time director, a full-time assistant director, that all each work 32 hours per week, plus six part-time employees. This is a little bit different governance structure. They are governed by the Board of Trustees, and the voters do approve the budget. So the select board, the library doesn't report up to the select board, they report to the Board of Trustees. However, their budget is included in the budget that's being considered this evening. Then the Water Resources Department, um, they are governed by the uh, Water and Sewer Commission. Their budget is not included in what we are considering this evening. But I wanted to mention that they service approximately 500 accounts, mostly located in the Richmond Village. The department consists of a full-time superintendent and three full-time staff members. So again, the water and wastewater budget contained in the town report I didn't put a page over in there. Actually, I did. 63 to 67 is where you'll find information on water and wastewater. So the budget in there is the FY23 budget. We're currently starting to build the FY24 budget. That'll be talked about throughout March and April at Water and Sewer Commission meetings. And then there'll be an annual meeting held in March 
where the Water and Sewer Commission will vote to finalize the FY24 budget. Um, so if you're interested in the water and wastewater budget, start to look at the commission meetings because the next few months you'll see more discussion about those budgets and then the annual meeting in May and a date to be determined is when that will be finalized. So now we're going to talk a bit more about reserve funding. On page 25 of the town report, you can see a chart that goes through each of our reserve funds, where they started out the fiscal year and where they ended up at the end of fiscal year 22, which again was last June 30th. So these funds, as we talked about, can be added to reserves yearly from tax revenue, and that amount is decided by the voters in the budget. Reserves can also be funded with non-tax revenue, such as the Town Center Maintenance Fund is funded largely with rents from Town Center tenants, and the Reappraisal Fund is funded by the State's Act 60 Reappraisal Permit. Reserves are used mostly for large capital purchases. Actual use of reserves does fluctuate a bit based on the yearly goals, and the use of reserves can factor heavily into the capital plan, which you can find on our website, and was just recently approved by the Select Board at, I think, their last meeting, or maybe one prior to that. So this is a chart that shows all of our reserves. I apologize that the writing is a bit small on the bottom, um, but it looks at the reserves. And you'll, the main thing to take away on this is, you'll see on the left-hand side, there's a few reserves that have large balances, and then it tapers off to smaller reserves that are they're much smaller balances. Uh, the biggest one there is the ARPA funding. And as of the end of last fiscal year, that was just over $600,000. And we've received another, uh, the same amount again here this fiscal year. So that's now at about $1.2 and I shouldn't use a shorthand, this is the American Rescue Plan Act, which is the money that every municipality in the country got as a response from the federal government from COVID. Um, after that, we've got Town Center Maintenance, Conservation Fund, Bridge and Culvert Fund, Records Restoration. So everything after ARPA are reserves that we've had on the books for a number of years. ARPA just sort of uh, started last year. So looking at total reserve growth from 2012 to 2022, I did not include ARPA on this because, again, that would have really thrown it out of whack. So I was trying to make sure that we were looking at the same reserve accounts over the last 10 years. And knowing that ARPA, we have the money, it's going to be spent in a shorter time frame, we have to spend it within a couple of years, while the other reserves are really tied into the capital plan, and we have a plan for how we're going to be spending those over the number of years to buy larger pieces of capital equipment. Um, so you'll see that in general, the slope of these have continued to slope up as the cost of items have gone up, and we've been saving for other items as we're planning for long-term capital improvements. 88% of all reserves are just eight accounts. Um, ARP is at 23%, Town Center Maintenance is at 16%, Conservation Fund is at 14%, Bridging Culverts is at 13%, Records Restoration at 7%, Cemetery Fund at 6%, Fire Department Reserve is at 6%, and the Highway Reserve is also at 3%. Next we're going to talk about, uh, oh sorry, we're still on reserve account usage. Right. So on page 20 is where you'll see that chart again that shows what are we doing in FY, oh wait, sorry. Sorry, page 20 is the revenue side of the budget. If you look down towards the bottom under the column for budget at FY23, you'll see where we plan to use reserves. So in FY23, we plan $64,500 in reappraisal reserves for the reappraisal. We also budgeted uh, $200,000 for a fire department truck and $24,750 for the police reserves to pay for a police cruiser. Neither one of these will actually be spent in FY23. The reason being on the fire truck, uh, we've ordered the fire truck, we've agreed to a contract with the fire truck, but the lead time on that is out two years for delivery. So we don't actually have to put a deposit down on that fire truck until uh, I think maybe next year or the year after. So we've got some time to pay for that fire truck. Fortunately, it's not going to be here as quickly as we'd like. Uh, but we still have that money in reserves and we will use it uh, at the appropriate time to pay for the truck. We also made the decision to not purchase police cruisers in this fiscal year or in FY24. We'll talk about that a bit more under the police budget, but essentially because we've been understaffed, the, truck, the police cruisers have been used a little bit more lightly, so we decided to extend that replacement cycle by a couple of years. So now we get to the chart on page 22 that looks at FY24 reserve accounts 
and the budgeted uses of reserves for FY24. So in the fire department, we're planning to spend $25,000 on the Jaws of Life, $5,000 on replacement of roof shingles at the fire station, $18,000 on air packs, $9,000 on air tanks for those air packs, and $8,000 on turnout gear. At Highway, we're planning to spend $53,000 on a pickup truck with a plow, and $100,000 on a tractor. And then we have a new sidewalk reserve, and this is for planning and construction of new sidewalks, so not maintenance of existing sidewalks, but for new sidewalks at the, um, so this one is phase one planning for a sidewalk that would run on the town center side of Bridge Street from essentially Jolina Court, which is the new building up by the railroad tracks, down to Esplanade. So now we're going to talk about unassigned and restricted funds. There's not really a page on the budget for this. You could look at page 20 to see the historical use of unassigned and restricted funds. And again, that's in the bottom couple of rows on page 20, which will show unassigned and restricted fund usage in 23 and in 24. So we talked a bit about how these are a combined underspending of good revenue and overspent, um, sorry, underspending and additional revenue. So it's a surplus that reverts to unassigned funds and restricted funds. Restricted funds, again, are just for the highway department. Unassigned funds are generated by any department except for the highway department and can be used for any department going forward. So the balance can increase if we get reimbursements from FEMA in subsequent fiscal years that those expenses were covered in previous fiscal years. Uh, we get underspending on budgeted expenses, such as where the department has vacancy savings due to being short-staffed, or also with grants that we receive due to budget spending. So our auditors have said that a combined unassigned and restricted fund balance of about 16% of the annual budget is healthy. Uh, that savings greatly helps reduce in the non greatly helps during an unanticipated crisis when cash flow is needed. So it's essentially about two months of the budget. So if we have a, a real big problem, you know, there's always loans you can go out to for emergency purposes, but having some money to be able to call on in a short, quick turnaround time, they recommend about 16%. So the fund balance is as of June 30th, 2022, an unassigned fund, we had about $848,000. In restricted funds, 940,000 for a combined total of 1.7 million, almost 1.8 million dollars. So that represents 35% of the 5 million FY23 budget. So on the high side. Taking a look at the combined change in unassigned and restricted funds, you can see that we've grown quite a bit in the last number of years, getting us up to that 1.8 million dollars. The percentages uh, used to be closer to that 15%, then we were leveled off around 25%, and now we're up to about 35 The next few slides are going to talk about how the select board has been viewing that and what we're trying to do to use those unassigned and restricted funds to get that number back closer to that 16% goal. So in FY23, the budgeted use of unassigned funds, we budgeted $50,000 due to a pending compensation study. What we were doing was taking a look at the compensation for all town employees. And at the time, we were in the middle of the study, also in the middle of the budgeting process. So we put $50,000 into the budget that's this current year, FY23, as a contingency thinking if we do need you know, to increase wages based on the study, we want to at least have something in the budget for that. And earlier, I mentioned that we shifted grounds maintenance, which is, you know, think of mowing of the park, the cemeteries, Browns Court. Um, that got shifted to a, uh, a contractor. We put $50,000 in for that for out of unassigned funds. We also budgeted $10,000 for the replacement of the server, $10,000 for replacement of the phone system and administration, uh, $4,000 to go towards legal, $300,000 as a general fund offset, and $50,000 for the purchase of highway equipment. The general fund offset wasn't tied to any specific purchase. It was really, towards the end of the budgeting process, we looked at, well, what have we used in unassigned restricted funds? Where's the tax rate? Where are we at kind of projecting for a percentage? And how much more of unassigned restricted could we use to offset the tax rate? And at the time, we decided to put $300,000 in to help offset what we needed to raise from taxes. 
Then we have some unbudgeted things that have come up already in FY23. Once the compensation study finalized, uh, it turned out that we needed $103,000 to pay for those increases. So we know that we'll be overspending those lines by $53,000. And by overspending, essentially, we'll be pulling out of the undecided funds. We also looked at thermal cameras for the uh, fire department and fire department air compressor needed to be replaced as well, which was unbudgeted at $45,000. And again, those are purchases that we needed to make, we're going to make in the fiscal year, and that will draw down from the surplus that we had. So now looking at restricted funds in FY23, um, we did the same thing for highway that we did in the general fund for compensation study. We had budgeted $30,000 in changes for FY23. When we got the actual report finalized, it looked, we were actually going to have an increase of about $55,000. So we, but we know that we're going to use about $25,000 in restricted funds and highway for wages. Um, we also used $415,000 to offset those three larger purchases that I talked about earlier. So rather than charging that to the taxpayers or taking a loan, we use restricted funds to help pay for those three big purchases in highway. Um, I think I asked one of the, oh yeah, and then we also have expected FEMA reimbursement. You'll see the $374,000 under FY23 column. So that goes back to the 2019 rainstorm. You remember trick-or-treating and the downpour, and then the next day we had a lot of road damage. So we're still waiting on re reimbursement from FEMA. We're expecting to get $374,000, and this is largely tied to the Dugway Road expense and the Dugway Road repairs and recall. That was down to one lane. It took quite a bit of effort to get that repair, and we're now waiting for reimbursement on that. So now we're looking ahead towards FY23, the end of this fiscal year. After we look at the budgeted and unbudgeted projections, the unassigned funds are projected to be at $266,000. The restricted funds are projected to be at $845,000. So the combined total is about $1.1 million, which is projected 24.5% of the $4.5 million budget that we're going into in FY24. So still higher than the 15 or 16% that we're budgeting for, that we're shooting for. So looking at that information through the budgeting process and in conversation with the select board, the decision was made to use $500,000 of restricted funds in FY24 to offset the tax revenue that would need to be raised. So this is restricted funds that will essentially offset the highway tax revenue. But at the end of the day, it's one big tax rate for everybody. So this is going to help take, offset the tax rate for everybody. And then we have, so the projected use um, of $500,000 in restricted funds, the unassigned funds projection stays the same at $266,000. The restricted funds would then drop to $345,000 projected at the end of FY24 for a combined total of $611,000, and that would get us to 13.5% of the $4.5 million budget. So we're down a little bit lower than the 16%, but certainly not up at 25 or 35%. And a note on these projections, so this is looking at if everything in the FY24 budget came in exactly as presented, we've spent every dollar to the penny, we got every revenue line in exactly the way it was, this is where we would be with unassigned restricted funds. The reality is there's going to be some ups, some downs, we might come in with a surplus again. So that number it might go up at the end of FY24 when we're looking at the information that we have and making the best choices that we can based on that um, to look forward to the end of FY24 and keep unassigned and restricted funds in a place that's closer to that 15 to 16 percent. <clears throat> so now we're going to look at general town debt. Um, there's not a page in the book for this one, but we'll run through the current bonds and current notes that we have out there. So we have a 2005 fire truck that comes due in 2026 for about $10,000 payment per year. A 2018 fire truck that comes due in 2026 for the payment of $51,000 per year. A 2019 dump truck, which payment comes due in 2024 at $24,000 per year. A 2020 dump truck, which is due in 2025, final payment, and that's $27,000 per year. We have a 2017 road grader, which we're paying until 2024 at about $30,000 per year. We had a Jericho road improvement that we're still paying on for another eight years at about $59,000. And we have stormwater improvement on Village Street that is being paid back through 2032 at about $7,000 per year. 
So now we're going to go through and look at each budget by department. I'm calling out some highlights. If you have a question about any specific budget line that I don't cover here or you want to get into more detail, please ask at the end. I just kind of tried to hit some of the bigger pieces. So again, you'll find the budget on page 11 through 20, and we'll start to go through kind of in page order by this one. So changes affecting multiple departments. I mentioned earlier that we did a compensation study, and that called for pay increases across most positions. We did have $50,000 unassigned funds budgeted for the general fund, and $30,000 in restricted funds budgeted for the increase in highway. The actual increases uh, were about $103,000 in, in every department except for highway, and $55,000 in highway, as we talked about. We know we're gonna be over on that. But those increases have been carried through into the FY24 budget. We now have a new pay grid uh, based on this study. Uh, every employee is budgeted to go up one step on the pay grid, and for the budgetary purposes, we planned on the pay grid increasing by about 5%, knowing that the cost of living and inflation has been running closer to 7% over the last several months. Changes affecting multiple departments, again, um, so in addition to the compensation study, uh, we also were looking at about a 19% increase in health insurance premiums. Uh, we have little control over this. We basically get the information from the state. We can do Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or um, what's the other one? MVP. MVP. It used to be. Um, so we looked at these increases, and no matter which way we went, we were looking at about a 19% increase. Um, we had recently renegotiated the union contract with the police um, about a year ago, and in that contract, they were doing a 10% contribution to health insurance. Prior to that, they were at 100% uh, covered by the town. So looking at that increase, the select board decided that we were going to move to 10% contribution to uh, health insurance premiums from employees. That actually started this calendar year, so this January, those contributions started because that's when the new rates for health insurance start, and we factored that into this budget for FY24. In the administration department, you'll find this budget on page 11 through 12. We increased the legal by $10,000 from $20,000 to $30,000. We decreased the independent auditors by $18,000 from $28,000 to $10,000. The reason for this decrease is that we went out to bid for, for our auditors, and we were able to get uh, a company that had a very competitive bid. We checked their references to make sure that they did a good job for other Vermont towns. And we've hired them, and they've conducted their first audit for us this year. And the actual price is more than 10000 but it's shared with water and sewer. So there's something 5000 that comes out of water and sewer. Uh, we decreased technology equipment by 6000 from 12000 to 6000 Again, we were budgeted to uh, replace a server in FY23. We won't have that expense in FY24. Um, the reappraisal reserve, uh, or sorry, the reappraisal services comes out of the budget because we will no longer be doing a reappraisal. So the money that we receive from the state will go back into the, into the reappraisal reserve funds to prepare for our next reappraisal, uh, which hopefully is years away. The police department budget uh, does not include the purchase of any police cruisers. Touched on it earlier that we made the decision to bump that replacement cycle out by a couple of years and not replace cruisers in FY24 because they've been used a little bit less than we would have anticipated had we been fully staffed. So that's a reduction of $99,000 from FY23. Uh, the fire department, we had a line in there for the purchase of the brush truck. We had anticipated using $200,000 in reserve funds. That was offset in the, in the revenue side by $200,000. As we talked about, that hasn't quite gone on schedule based on production delays, but that did come out of the FY24 budget. It's no longer in there for FY24, so that's a reduction in the fire department from one year to the next. Uh, we increased the fire capital reserve line by $95,000. Um, from 55,000 to 150. This ties back heavily to the capital, um, the capital plan. As we look at the cost of fire trucks, which continue to increase, the age of our fire trucks and the timeline for replacement, this $150,000 helps us save towards replacing the fire trucks in the future. I'm sorry, I got a little away from the page numbers. On page 17, we're on recreation and trails. Um, we reduced the volunteers green parking lot line uh, down to zero. Last year's budget, we put $5,000 in to look at paving the volunteers being parking lot. We wanted to have a contingency in there if we needed some engineering costs for that. Uh, it turns out we, we didn't need engineering. Pete was able to 
sketch it out and figure it out in-house, so we didn't actually spend that 5000 and we don't need to spend it uh, this coming fiscal year either, and that's budgeted or scheduled to be paid this spring, so that will still be paved within this fiscal year, which we have until the end of June to get that paved. We also added in a line uh, for July 4th fireworks for a total of $13,000. There's a separate committee that for years and years has done the, all of the work to plan for the fireworks and plan for the parade and do fundraising. Uh, they came to the select board during the budgeting season and said they needed some help with the fundraising. So the board decided that the town, it should be a town expense. So we've added in $13,000 for fireworks for the July 4th celebration. Under charitable appropriations, um, Richmond Rescue, they reduced their request of us by $19,000 from $78,000 down to about $58,000 this was not the town deciding to underfund Richmond Rescue. This was the request that Richmond Rescue gave to the town. They recently expanded their services to include Hinesburg and St. John's. St. George? St. George. Sorry. Um, not St. John's. St. George. I'm thinking it, um, so with that, they've had an increased call volume, and they've been able to um, get more revenue based on those calls. So their, uh, their requests per town actually went down for each town and ours went down fairly significantly, but they still continue to provide the same great service, just at a little less cost to all of our time folks. In highway, their budget is found on pages 18 through 19. Uh, there's an increase of $12,000 in diesel fuel from 43,000 to 55,000. Increased cost of gas is going through for everybody. And we use a lot of diesel fuel to keep the roads clean. Increased funding for illuminated crosswalks. So these are the types of crosswalks like you'll see at the top of Bridge Street where you push the button, the flashers go off, and you can go across the street. So we budgeted in $6,500 to purchase another crosswalk in FY24. I don't know exactly where we're replacing that yet, but we want to have the money there because we know that they can greatly increase pedestrian safety. We've also talked a lot about traffic calming measures, uh, and we put in $10,000 in the budget to purchase items that would go towards traffic calming. So this is, um, when we hear from residents about uh, speeding or unsafe driving on any road, there's a number of things that we can do. It can range from uh, signage or paint on the on the side, paint on the on the road to remind people about the speed limits or fog lines. We can put in temporary or permanent speed humps, um, and all that costs money. And there's a process to, to working through all that. And yes, it can be quite slow. Uh, but we want to make sure that we have some money there so that if there's a recommendation that we want to move forward with some of these measures, that we have a budget to do so. So we've put in $10,000 for traffic calming for FY24. We've also increased the retreatment line. This is paving. Uh, Pete's got a really good plan for paving. He's got a cycle for each road. Uh, so this year's calls for about $325,000 in paving, and the cost of paving has continued to increase as um, everything else these days. So based on the miles of roads that Pete's looking to pave in FY24 and the current pricing, we need to make an increase there. We also increased uh, $20,000 in the stormwater and sidewalks from 120 to 140. Uh, most of that increase is actually uh, from information from our engineer saying that uh, the state permitting is actually going to go up quite a bit for some of these uh, developments that the town is, is partnered with. Um, so that permit process could be upwards of $20,000. So we wanted to make sure that we were ready for that and included that in the budget. Uh, then here's that reduction of $530,000 in the highway department that we talked about. So last year we purchased a dump truck, a bucket loader, an excavator, and those were all included in the budget. We're not purchasing those this year. Um, all that equipment was purchased with a combination of uh, tax revenue and restricted funds. We also had an increase of $25,000 in the contribution to the Highway Capital Reserve Fund from $25,000 to $50,000. And again, this ties back to the capital plan, which as we look forward for large highway purchases, we're trying to make sure that we can do that without loans as much as possible. Uh, so putting the money away now to pay for budget, for pay for those pieces of equipment in the future is uh, calling for $50,000 this year. And let's see, highway increase of $10,000 in contribution to the guardrail reserve fund from $5,000 to $15,000. I know that Pete's got his eye on a number of guardrails and some larger projects around town. Um, so we want to make sure we have enough money to pay for those guardrails. And guardrails are very expensive. You, you don't get a lot for uh, $15,000 probably, even it's less than we would all think and like. 
a reduction of $5,000 in contribution to New Sidewalk Reserve from $30,000 down to $25,000. That kind of ties back into, as we're looking at what we're planning, what do we need to plan for for payments for this year and the next four or five years. And last year we put $30,000 in. We got a little bit better of a budget on that, so we're able to reduce that to $25,000. I think that is it. So I'm going to grab a drink of water, and you guys can take some questions. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that comprehensive uh, presentation. Now is the time for any uh, discussion or questions, so we'll field those. Yes, sir. Uh, can we get the microphone over here in the, in the bleacher end? Hello, my name is Pete Halverson. Uh, Josh, I've got one question on the definitions. Uh, can you help me with the unassigned funds, the restricted funds? I think I got that understood. But are the reserve funds categorized as unassigned funds at the same time? Thank you. No, that's a, that's a good question. These are hard to kind of, because <laughs> the wording is sort of similar. So reserve funds are not unassigned or restricted funds. So think of unassigned and restricted as a, uh, a budget surplus at the end of the year. It's, it's usually, it's unbudgeted. We didn't expect to have that extra money, but it's there, so that then goes into either unassigned or restricted. The reserve funds are specific funds that we fund deliberately with, with money that's going in either from non-tax revenue, like the leases, the lease payments in the town center, or you'll see in the budget there's calls for contributions. And then those are spent out of specifically on certain projects and, and pieces of equipment. Um, so I would, I would characterize it really as reserve funds are, are planned with planned uh, deposits and planned withdrawals for purchases, whereas unassigned and restricted are more unplanned surpluses that then we try to plan to spend them down if they get too high. Does that help answer the question? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Up in the bleachers. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I think I'm going to go back, like... Can you please state your name? Oh, yes, Toby Buxton. Sorry, brother. Um, let's see, going back, I think, 24 minutes into your presentation, which was very good. Um, the, on the Conservation Reserve Fund, you had indicated, you had a slide up there that said 48000 based on the current... I don't remember what slide it was, I didn't see the numbers. getting close. Anyways, I think it was $48,000 and then you indicated that if the grand list increases, which we're pretty sure it all will, um, after we, what May is when the reappraisals are back out or something like that. So would the select board remind the voters on how that money is spent and how decisions are made to spend that money? Would that be appropriate to share with the voters? Thank you. So the con conservation reserve funds are spent, uh, they, all that money needs to be approved by the select board. And the conservation commission will present to us some project or, um, or repair that needs to be done. Recently they paid to have a bench put on one of the trails. Um, so does that answer your question about it being spent? Yeah, so, so the select board is the one that Yes. I know that in the past, when the it first started, I think the voters had the opportunity to decide what it was spent for. But now it's solely up to the select board to make the decision on how to spend that forty-eight, ninety thousand, whatever. It is. Okay. Yes, and if um, when there is a request, it does go on the agenda for the select board meeting. So. That is the opportunity for our community members to come in if, if they are in favor of that request or if they are not. But, but again, the, the, the but decision, the decision is, is ultimately up to the select board. Yes, Thank it you. is. Can I add just two yes. minutes, please? So I just want to add to that. There's actually a guidance document as well for how that money should be spent. And the way the process goes is an application is made to the conservation fund. Um, 
to the Conservation Commission. And in that application, the request for will outline their project, outline how it ties in to the require, requirements uh, that are outlined for expenditures from the Conservation Fund. Then the Conservation Commission will make a recommendation for funding or not to the Select Board. The Select Board would then review that, review that request in relation to what the Conservation Commission has to say about it and what the documentation says about it and then make that make that final call. So there is a lot of guidance that goes along with this. Uh, but yes, ultimately it is the select board that makes that final decision. And I want to just also note that the $48,000 that would be budgeted to go into that reserve, the full amount that's in the reserve, give me one second, is on page 25. Someone might find it before me. Uh, conservation. Yeah. Yeah, so, it, I, yeah, so the full amount is $385,000 as of the end of uh, June 30th, FY22. Um, so there's still a contribution to go in in FY23, and there's been some expenses in FY23 as well. So uh, the 48000 will get added to, uh, to the current budget. Just wanted to add a couple of things. Um, for those of you who have a copy of the town report, at the bottom of page 71, list the projects that were performed at its third bottom of 71, list the projects that were performed using conservation reserve fund money just in the past year. It's a really remarkable list. And another thing that I'd like to call out, which was news to me until very recently, the conservation reserve fund did a stellar presentation to us and pointed out that for every dollar that is released from the conservation reserve fund, they are able to leverage three more dollars in terms of grants and other funding. So they are doing a phenomenal job as stewards of that money. Thank you. Any other questions regarding uh, the article? Yes, sir, in the back, and then I'll move there. Thank you. Um, my name is Brad Elliott. Just one quick uh, correction on the conservation fund. There is a clause in, in the policy that says if the town is going to purchase land that's valued more than 20000 the voters do. Have to vote on that. <clears throat> that isn't totally the select board. On that. Thank you. And I think that's only happened once. Thank you. Over here at our rear. Yeah, little Mary Sunshine, Mary Pool. I have a question about the sidewalks. Um, I know that there is a boatload of money that's proposed for a sidewalk, pretty much that goes nowhere for serving three houses from the bridge, in front of the town center, in front of the library, to Julina Court. I really think it's stupid. However, has anything been done to improve the sidewalk that currently exists, or is it gonna be like, oh, a certain land trust that continues to acquire things and not do anything to repair or maintain? So my question is, has anything been done to improve the sidewalk that is existing before the acquisition and the total tillage of that property in front of the cemetery to serve three houses in Julina Court. Thank you. Mary, you're talking about the existing sidewalk on Bridge Street? Yeah. <coughs> the sidewalk is there now. The sidewalk? The one that's in front of the town center or on the opposite side of the town center? Uh, the one that's on the opposite side. I just want to know which sidewalk. I'm sorry. There's no sidewalk in front of the town Well, there's center. a small walkway, I guess. So not that one. The one across the street. <coughs> not right. the, the one, one that, that I plant the flowers on. The one that exists from Esplanade all the way up to the market, to the block. So Pete, Thank you. And you've got to, Pete's got a plan to replace that this summer or next? This spring. This it's spring. It's going to concrete. Okay, so that's not, Pete, you can't hear. Pete has that in the budget for this coming summer to go to concrete from asphalt. So that is going to be addressed. Thank you. Any other questions on Article 2? Yes, ma'am, up in the bleachers. My name is Dolores Carter. I have a question on the upper sidewalk situation. I believe I read someplace where the sidewalks were going to be put in, they were going to put a little narrow strip of grass between the road and the sidewalk. Um, I wondered why they needed that strip of grass since it doesn't get taken care of. The weeds are going to be growing in there and when you ride through town it looks like a mess. Yeah. 
Pete, yeah, Pete, you know? yeah Pete, Pete has the answer to this, but that's one of the designs that's being discussed. It was, it was a safety issue. Are you uh, relating this to the piece on Bridge Street that's going to be upgraded to concrete? That is okay. So if you if you know much about Bridge Street, there's a series of power poles that separate the driving lane from the sidewalk currently. Those can't be moved, and you can't pour concrete around those things right tight to a curb. So you have to put in what's called a green belt, which is like a two foot piece of grass. It will have to be be maintained, but it, it acts as two things. It acts as, it acts as a buffer for the pedestrians and traffic, and it also gives us a better, a little more area to put snow when we plow. So when the plow truck goes down the road, they're not splattering all over the, uh, the pedestrians. This is an issue we're having on West Main Street right now in front of the Catholic Church. We're constantly pushing the snow back out of Route 2 and the state comes through and puts it back on the sidewalk. So the green belt really serves a really good, pur uh, good, good purpose for that. So because of the power poles, there was really no other option too. So that's kind of the two reasons for that. Thank you. Any other questions regarding Article 2? Right there in the back. Hi, uh, Sophie Cassell. I might have missed this at a previous town meeting. I'm curious about the paving of the Volunteers Green parking lot and whether or not uh, it was discussed whether to like gravel it instead, pave it, and what sort of like environmental decisions went into that. So, so, you want to mention Pete? So Pete, Pete is saying that it's already gravel, and part of the decision to go to paving is we can expand it a little bit. We can also put pavement markings down to show exactly where people are able to park, because we've been having a lot of issues of people kind of parking wherever, making their own spots up. So by being able to delineate where parking is, we're hoping that we have a better flow of traffic and better parking in that area as well, and it'll just be a little bit nicer to as you come in, because you know, as much as Pete keeps it in good shape, it's a gravel lot can deteriorate rather quickly. Thank you. Was there another question in the right in the rear? Okay, turn around, there you go. Denise Barner, going back to Mary Hool's question, could someone tell me approximately what, how much is the sidewalk gonna cost from the town center? And I, I just wanna make sure I understand this correctly. It's going to be from the town center where we cross in front of the library, it's going to take the green space in front of the cemetery, and then it's going to take the green space in front of the former TD Bank building. Is that correct? Yeah, so the ultimate goal on the sidewalk is going to be it'll pick up by Big Spruce, where it leaves off now. It'll continue down in front of the old TD Bank building, in front of the cemetery, in front of the library, in town, town center, down to Esplanade Street. Could you give me a rough idea of the cost of that project? Jay, I'm just, just talking about an ARPA, so I was wondering, I could look it up, but I didn't know if you're off the top of your head. Was it 600,000, Kara? So it was 600,000 for both phases? 300 per phase. Okay, yeah, and then phase two, phase one, which is the southern phase, we're applying for a grant that I think it's a 20% match, right? Yes. So we would pay 20% and the grant would pay 80% on that grant. Is that right? I was checking with my ARPA people. <laughs> Thank you. If, I, if, 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 if that explanation was not clear, we can give her a microphone. I just want to make sure. Okay. D Denise, did you have a, did, did you have a follow-up question? Yes, I, just a couple more questions. I, I hate to see more green space being taken away in the downtown village area. And if you all remember on July 4th, there are hundreds of people sitting in front of that cemetery on that green space. Um, and in our town, do we really need another sidewalk across the road where in the budget you have 
um, put allocated more money to make the pedestrian crosswalk safer, and we have one in front of the library, we have one in front of Sweet Simone's that goes across, and Northfield, who is going to be going into TD Bank, have stated they are going to do incredible lettering on their crosswalks to make it safer. Do we really need to rip up in front of the former TD Bank and again in front of the cemetery? Why can't we um, ax that project, save the green space, and save the town some money? Josh, thank you. Can we have a go ahead, please? So I have a little bit of an answer. It's not the only answer, but um, we've done studies on the walkability of downtown Richmond. There have been a number of studies done. And one of the things that's come back is the inconvenience, especially for those who are mobility limited, people who are using walkers, people who don't walk very fast. If you want to start at the intersection of well, Main Street and Bridge Street and go all the way to the town center and stay on sidewalks, you really can't. You have to, if you go down the, the west side and then you want to cross over and get to the town center, you're having to cross traffic. And it would be the studies and I kind of agree with this show that it would be more walkable if we had sidewalks on both sides where you would not have to keep crossing the street. That's, that your, your mileage may vary as to whether you agree with that, but that's what the studies have come back and kind of said would be a good plan. Thank you. Any other questions on Article 2? First time around? Yes, ma'am, right in the center. My name is Betsy Hardy. It's not a question, but I, may I make a comment about the sidewalk on the east side of Bridge Street? Go ahead. So, um, so I live in the village on the Jericho Road. I walk a lot. I, I try not to drive if I'm just going into the village. So when I'm going to the post office or the library, um, I do have to cross Bridge Street down there by the library and you can push the button for the lights to flash, but you still have to really wait to see if the cars are going to slow down, and it's not uncommon that they don't. Um, it, it can be a dangerous crossing. Um, so if there was a sidewalk down the east side, I would cross Jericho Road at, well, I would either, I'll admit to jaywalking across Jericho Road to get onto the east side, or I would cross at the four corners um, to be on the east side, on the Green Sea side, and then I could go all the way down to the post office and the library. I wouldn't have to cross further down. Um, and I don't always walk very fast, so I would feel safer. So just wanted to thank you back for that. Any other questions on Article 2? Um, since you gave an explanation, I'll allow you to provide a question now. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Carol Avanti. I appreciate having the opportunity to ask a question. First of all, Josh, I want to say that is the best explanation of unrestricted and uh, on unallocated and restricted funds that we've had over the years, so I really appreciate you delving into that and the select board for actually taking the time to stop building unknown funds for unknown reasons and finding reasons for them, so thank you. Um, it brings me to my question of the 500000 that you're using on page 20 for the highway. The highway has been explained that the restricted funds, basically the leftover funds from your taxes that weren't spent um, within a fiscal year are restricted, are restricted strictly for highway, while the unallocated are general funds that can be used for the highway or anything else you need them for. Is there a reason why you're using unassigned funds of 500,000 in the highway area rather than the restricted funds in the highway area? Or is that possibly a typo? Right. So, it, so you're right, the wording is not consistent. We need to correct that. But that, so it says highway equipment 
offset or the yeah, offset from highway unassigned funds. So I think what we meant was highway restricted funds, and we should we should remain consistent with the wording. I agree with you, and we'll make sure that we correct so that. So we those are restricted funds. Okay. Yes. So that's very important for us to be using restricted highway funds for highway projects, and not the unassigned general funds, the unallocated general funds. So we are in agreement that if we vote for the FY24 budget, you're using the restricted highway funds, the 500,000. 500, Correct, yes. And is there any reason why in the whole presentation that the, maybe the can next year town report, you have a projected balance of what any of the funds are the reserves, the unallocated and the restricted, will be for the FY24? 23 fiscal year end? For unassigned and restricted? Yes. Well, and for all your reserves as well. Um, because if at the end of FY23 you're going to have another $500,000 because you had um, salaries that were not used and other funds that were not used, it's a good idea for us to realize that we might be able to use another $500,000 next year in FY23. 25, I mean the following year. So I'm just asking, yeah. can we keep a running toll? You only have FY22 in here. When you must know as of FY23, you're halfway through the year, what you're projecting for FY23. So here you're looking at page 25, when we're looking at the, the balance at the end of 21 to the balance at the end of 22? Correct. Okay. Yeah, so, so the reason, so why we've done that and not projected, is because in the budget we're trying to put in, or in the document we're trying to put in the audited, the audited number for the end of fiscal year 22. So in the presentation, that's where I tried to say, when we look forward to the end of 23, this is where undecided and restricted is going to be based on factors that we know. And then, then this slide shows, so then spinning forward for that, we go to 24. So I just didn't want to put projections into the report, but maybe there's a way to do that. But I've sort of erred on, let's keep the facts in the report. My concern is, and I'll, I'll make this, I'll go quickly. My concern is, is knowing that the police department is understaffed and has been understaffed for years. We have a potential, you know, I think that's a $750,000 budget. We have a potential of really banking more money in FY24 that you budgeted for, and it would be a savings, quote, and go into the unallocated bucket again. So we might want to chew up more of that unallocated bucket and that restricted bucket, rather than just the 500,000, you could have possibly done 700,000. But we won't, you would know, we wouldn't, based on FY23 um, quarterly financials that you've received. Thank you. But thank you for using the 500000 I truly appreciate it. Okay. Any other questions or comments first time around? Yes, sir. Right there in uh, Malachi, right to your right-hand side. Stick your hand up, will you? I believe she had a question. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. I have a question. Okay. Did you have a question? I do. Stick your hand up. Yeah, I, I think I think everybody the first time around has had it, so we'll give you the second time around. Oh, we had one here. I'm sorry, I didn't see that yet. Hi, I'm Jeannie and Haskin, and I have a question about the police budget. So, I see that we have roughly a seven hundred thousand dollar police budget, and just wondered if the town has. Compare the cost of what it would cost us if we hired the state police and or sheriffs to, to oversee the town. Part of my concern is in the past the, the residents have asked the police department to give us a report of what they do with their time, you know, how many calls they make for each different thing. And, and I've never seen that. I've never seen it in the Times Inc. I've never seen it in the front porch forum. So I have no way of knowing what they do with their time other than when I see them sitting around town, parked someplace, trying to catch speeders. I can tell you the day my husband died and we called the Richmond police, we got Williston police. They weren't even there to cover it. So it's like, 
what would it cost us to eliminate the force, eliminate the ma you know, maintenance of the vehicles, and hire the state police and our sheriffs? Thank you, Jean Ann. That is a question um, that's been asked uh, multiple times over the years about you know, what does Richmond want? And I, I believe each time that question is asked, the community wants a, a police department here. We, um, because we are short staffed, and most police departments in Vermont right now and across the country are short staffed, um, we, we've been working hard at figuring out how to fill the gaps. Um, one of the things, and I've had a conversation with the um, Vermont State Police, the Colonel of the Vermont State Police, they're not taking on more towns. They're already down um, 15, well the last I heard was 15 troopers. So they, they are not um, able to take any more responsibility on and they've sent a letter to multiple towns saying they will only respond to towns that have police departments um, if it's a life or death situation. So we, I mean, we could ask that question again, but we have asked the question multiple times, do we want a police department? And so what we are going to be doing, um, because we're in the search uh, for a police chief now, but part of that um, question is, can we find a better way of doing this? So we are, we've been talking with Heinsberg about looking at the uh, idea of a union municipal district. That's a multi-year, process if it's if we decide that that's the road we want to go down we are going to um, hire a police chief who knowing that this could be a, a temporary position because we may move in this direction but we need a a, a partner town that says yes this is something we want to do so there's a lot of questions on our the future of our police so I appreciate you asking that because we are working on trying to figure out what it is that's going to serve Richmond best. Oh, and at the bottom of page 31, thank you, Jay, our challenges and uh, the challenges and opportunities. Um, this is the report from the select board regarding, um, you know, what we've been facing with the police department. I'd like to add one other thing. Um, I've heard from numerous people saying, um, if we're having a hard time filling positions, why don't we just pay people more? Um, in the last year, we did, as Josh has referenced, we did do a compensation study that was fairly intricate and detailed, comparing what we're paying the various positions within town as compared to peer institutions across Vermont. Not necessarily those immediately in Chittenden County, but the towns like us across Vermont. And as a result of that, we did raise the compensation across the board. Um, in some cases, we really were lagging behind our peers. Um, that, unfortunately, got us caught up, but we're already starting to lag again. It is difficult in this market to basically be the one that everybody wants to work for because we're just our salaries are so great. We just can't afford to do that. We are doing everything we can creatively to try to fill these positions. We are trying to make the reimbursement, the compensation um, competitive. But even with that, it's, if we could wave a magic wand and say, we have three more officers, we'd do it yesterday. If, if you know anybody who would like to be an officer here in Richmond, um, please let us know. Thank you. Any uh, other questions first time around? Yes, right here in the center. Thank you, Angela Cote. My question is about the FEMA reimbursement monies that you mentioned for the Dugway Road repair work. Where would that, when would we receive that, theoretically? And where would that money be placed? Would it be unassigned because, or would it be reserved, or would it be restricted? Because would that be a highway department reimbursement? And is it likely to happen in fiscal year 23? Thank you. That's a good question. Um, so it is likely to happen in fiscal year 23. We've had all of our paperwork into FEMA. The state has signed off on it. Um, I believe FEMA's even officially signed off on it. There's like one more form. They finally got us for final, final signed off apparently. Um, so I anticipate that hopefully within the next couple of months, so within FY23, 
and then all of that money will go back to restricted funds for the highway because all of that money was spent on a project at Dugway Road, so it's all highway funding. So that will then ultimately increase our restricted funds, which is where we showed it on the chart. Um, see if I can get to a quick ad back here. Um, So you'll see there the 374, 486 is showing to increase our projection of restricted funds. Thank you. First time all the way in the back, please. John Cart, I was just going to call the question. Okay. The uh, question has been called. And then, as I indicated, that requires a two-thirds majority in which to um, in which to call the, that question. So um, we do need a second for that. We do need a second for uh, calling the question. Is there a second for calling the question? Alan Oles, I second. And a second for calling the question. Okay. Very good. So, I will uh, now, hang on a second, there we go. All discussion must cease. This does require a two-thirds majority in which to cease discussion. And I would uh, now pose it to the assembled. All those in favor of ceasing any discussion on the budget, please so signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. no. The chair is in question. <laughs> so, um, at this point in time, I guess I would ask all those in favor of ceasing debate, would you please stand and uh, the Justice of the Peace will do the counting. Yes, and, and, and stay standing until I tell you to sit down. <laughs> Was that a whistle? The people who are standing now are voting. Which way are they voting? Yes. So again, I'll, I'll repeat this again. If you are standing, you are in favor of ceasing debate. And that means there's no, no additional discussion. We would move right to the article, um, uh, of the budget article. So if you're standing, that means you would, you've heard enough and you would like to cease to make debate. So please remain standing until we get a count. I will remind the assembled if you're not a resident, you can't be standing or um, voting on this.
Okay, I've got the word from the Justice of the Peace that you all may be seated at this point in time. So those that are um, would like to continue to debate and in voting against call uh, ceasing discussion, would you now please stand? Moderator is in question. Okay, you all may now sit down. Thank you. The, the uh, motion in which to cease debate has failed. So we will continue debate on Article 2. Are there any other questions or comments on Article 2? First time around. Okay, any questions or comments the, for the second time around? Up there in the, um, up at the top of the bleachers, I, this is Toby Buxton. I, I, I'm sorry, uh, the gentleman that made the motion to decease the discussion. I think his name was Mr. Carr. He's ruined my evening, and I'm going to sit down and not say <laughs> Thank you. Uh, top of the bleachers, please. Thank you. Carol Abounty. So back to the question about the sidewalks, um, I wanted to bring that back around if you don't mind. Um, Pete Goslin, um, I know you have a plan for the existing sidewalks on Bridge Street and I really appreciate you speaking on that. Um, I know maintaining the sidewalks and doing the infrastructure has been a lot of work for you. Would you mind um, commenting on the new sidewalks and your input on that? And if you feel that it's a necessity once the existing sidewalks and, and crosswalks and the safety measure, measures are in, have you seen those plans? Do you have any, any input on that at all? No, no, I don't want to put any input on that. No comment? Okay. No I got you. I didn't know if you'd seen the plans. That was all so that people could understand. Thank you. Any other questions, I think, down here on the floor? Second time around. Jeanine Haskin. Um, I have a question about the budget voting. So, budget's always passed at an in-person vote at town meeting. Could we potentially have, like, a town meeting in October where the budget is prepared and and everybody gathers and everybody votes and does all of what we're doing tonight in October or November. And then when when it's time for voting on everything else, have the budget on Australian ballot. So that everybody in the town of Richmond who's a registered voter has the opportunity to vote on the budget. 
We all have the opportunity to come tonight and hear about the budget. Everybody will still have that opportunity at a different time. Then the budget's finalized, presented, let everybody vote on it. People should, you know, people, everybody should have an opportunity to vote on the budget. It shouldn't just be all of us here tonight. Thank you. Would you like to respond to that? Yes, I would like to respond. Jeannie, thank you very much, and thank you for your very thoughtful post on Front Porch Forum regarding this issue. We had a preliminary meeting. Order, moderator, please. Sorry. But are we discussing the budget itself or discussing the whether we should be voting on the budget? I, 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 be, I believe this is this is germane for the moment. I'll, I'll, I'll let it go. <coughs> So, Tina and I will let you know that we we discussed that length at our preliminary meeting Saturday morning, um, your post, and it would require a charter change to change how we currently vote on the budget. So, um, but it, it, we have talked about it. I, I'd just like to add, um, we do have public meetings on October, November, December, to which the public is more than welcome to come. In fact, we, we practically beg for it. Um, every town voter is welcome to come to these meetings. These are special select board meetings that are held typically like the third, the, the second week. So first and third is a regular select board meeting. And then we'll have a second week in October, second week in November, second week in December. And everybody is welcome. Those, those meetings are warmed. The proposed budget that we're looking at as of that step is in the packet. It's available. It's posted on Front Door Forum. It's available on the website. Um, and some voters do come. Um, sometimes we'll get five or ten people coming to those meetings, and we're, they're very welcome. We'd like to get a lot more. We would like this budget to be really a collaborative effort of the whole town if we can get that input. But right now, um, what Jan, what you're asking for is basically the status quo. People just need to take advantage of it. Thank you, Josh. Did you have anything to add? So I'll just add a, a little bit about the procedure. So in order to change it to Australian ballot, it would need to be voted uh, by voice either at a regular town meeting tonight uh, or, a, how, or a meeting called for that purpose so that the people in attendance could vote on voice vote. Do we keep it on Australian on voice vote or do we go to Australian ballot? Another option is to call a special meeting where those in attendance vote to put that question on Australian ballot and then there would be a, a vote in the future by Australian ballot, which would ask the question of, do we want to move the budget vote to Australian ballot? So it's either a one-step or a two-step process to get to that answer from hearing from the people of the town, either through voice vote or through Australian ballot to move it to Australian ballot. So there is a, a way to do that, as other towns have done, and Richmond could go that way if they like. Um, and then I think, just to sort of tie back into what Jay was saying, if it went to Washington ballot, then I believe we would be required to have a public informational hearing on, the, on that ballot item, which would have to come within 10 days of the, of the vote. So that if the vote was tomorrow, it would be within the previous 10 days. And then there would be opportunities for people to get together and discuss the budget. However, at that point, there would not be an opportunity to amend the budget. There would be lots of discussion, and then it would be an up or down vote on Australian ballot. And to further expand on what Jay was saying, that is the process, October, November, December. If there's certain items that people feel passionately about or strongly about, there's a three months to provide feedback either in a meeting or via email to myself or a select board member. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Right here and uh, yeah, right there. We got a microphone coming to you. Hi, I'm Christy Witters. A few years ago, we voted to move um, town meeting to um, Monday night to make it more accessible. And I am kind of curious about whether or not after the pandemic with more flexibility for work schedules on Tuesday, um, if we wanted to consider moving it back to well, Tuesday. Um, I, I will now take the point of order <laughs> that, uh, that, that this is not specifically germane to the budget, so I would, uh, I would ask us. There is a, we'll, we'll have a chance to talk to that and our other business. So if you could hold till then, I appreciate that. Do we have another question over here? 
In the rear? Amanda Kiruthi. Um, so my question is around the Conservation Reserve Fund. Um, is that fund, can unassigned reserve money be spent by that group? It's completely separate. I'm seeing not, okay. So that's why it's separately needs to be addressed when money is needed there, our property tax have to be raised. I just want to make sure, are you asking if unassigned funds could be moved into the conservation fund? Yeah, at all. Conservation can't withdraw any unassigned from other parts of the town budget? No. Correct, yeah. Okay. It's just for that fund. Okay. Okay. That fund currently has a 14% surplus? So there's not really a surplus. Or, uh, overage or something early on in the presentation, but I didn't see it in here. And it um, might have been a different. So the conservation fund doesn't really have a surplus because there's not, there's not really, a, uh, I guess, an overall goal for, for that fund. So that fund, every year there's a vote on whether the town would like to put money, more money into the fund. And at that point, it should be one cent on the, on the tax rate. So that would be, in this case, about $48,000, but probably more once the conservation, or once the grant goes up. Um, <clears throat> then the overall budget number in there, I think we just talked about, is at uh, $385,000 as of the end of last fiscal year. Um, and there's no, like, goal for that number, if that's what you're asking. Is that, am I understanding it correctly? So, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to think where the 14% came from, sorry. Right. Well, at the beginning, there were like the top five oh, groups that yes. had the largest amount of reserve, yeah. and I thought that was one of them, and I might have missed Yes, that. now I know what you're saying. So here is the slide you're referring to. So that's just saying that of the $2.3 million that we have in reserves across all reserve funds, 14% yes. of that is in the conservation fund. It's not that that's a goal, it's just a statement of where it's at. Okay. But of all of those, conservation is the only one that can't access unassigned. So yeah, I mean, no. it, so if, if there's a if there's a request to use conservation funding, right? That we talked about the process where it goes to the commission, it goes to the select board. So that's specifically to using money in that in that fund. If there was a request to say buy something that exceeded that or if the select board said gee we'd rather you know we think that's a good project it doesn't quite fit but we're willing to overspend another line then essentially by overspending another line it would be pulled out of unassigned funds but the 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 application can't really be to two unassigned funds does that, yeah, that make sense yeah okay. Okay. okay does that make sense if that does that answers okay. i think my question i had a second question but maybe we can go around yeah any other questions first time around? I can't remember. Are you a first timer or a second timer? Go ahead. Go, go ahead. I think you were a second timer. It was a long time ago. Uh, this is P. Halverson again. Uh, she, she made me uh, think of a question. So uh, the, the select board can put money into all these reserve funds from undersigned funds, correct? So are you able to take uh, funds from different reserves into different other reserves? No, because once they're, and, and I think the mechanism to take it from unassigned and put it into the reserve would actually have to go through the budgetary process to move that money in there. Um, but once it's in the reserve, then it is earmarked for things that are specific to that reserve's uses. So if it's in the fire reserve, we can't buy a highway truck with it, and vice versa. So it has to stay specific. The use of that has to be specific to what that reserve is for. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, our town clerk has something to add here. Uh, the select board and Josh did list on that uh, list of accounts the cemetery fund and the records restoration. None of that comes from tax money. Uh, cemetery fund is 
funded by people buying cemetery plots. Um, and if somebody gives a donation to our cemetery, that goes in there. And it's used for maintenance of the cemeteries. We spent five, we spent $7,000 to take down some trees this last year. And um, then we've spent money on cleaning stones and repairing some stones in the cemeteries. And the record restoration is completely funded by how many recordings we do in my office for your land records and liens and mortgages. Part of each page of the $15 per page goes into record restoration and that can only be used for record restoration. You know, whether we're having books copied and, and preserved or equipment to do that with, that's what it's for. None of it comes from taxes. Thank you. Was there a question over there? No. Any other? Yeah, yes, up in the bleachers. Jack Lynn, um, going back to beating a dead horse, and that's the police department. Uh, and I'm sure one of the problems with recruiting is housing enrichment. And I understood that in the past, you know, the chief lived X miles, X hours away, and he took the uh, the uh, police, his car, back to the house, and his pay starts, his hourly rate starts when he leaves the house. And I wonder if, if Richmond knows that it's, if, if the guy lives, you know, an hour and a half away, so he spends an hour and a half driving one way, an hour and a half driving the other way, that's three hours out of five hours, or out of eight hours. It just seems like that's a real problem. And I would hope that that's addressed. Thank you. Jack, thanks for the question. So um, a couple of things that we did change in the last agreement with the union, sorry, in the last agreement with the union, where we have the police cruisers, the take-home cruisers are in that agreement. And what we did in this agreement was we set a mileage limit for new officers that we hire so that we're trying to encourage them to live closer and also not pay for the the mileage beyond a certain amount. And I, I forget the exact mileage that we put in there, but we did put a limit there. We also made it sure that their shift does not start until they get to Richmond. So if they do live 45 minutes away, that commuting time is not paid time. They Their shift starts when they get to Richmond and ends when they leave Richmond, so we're not paying for the community. Thank you. Other questions? Way up in the bleachers. Hi, Martha Marcial. Do you have figures on how much has been spent from the Conservation Fund over the last few years? I can, I can pull it up. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Well, there was a conversation about um, if we're going to have a presentation on that, but I do have their presentation handy. So let me pull that up so we can all take a look. The, part of the answer is that each, if you go back through the town records, each of the town reports signifies year by year what's been spent so you can get it that way. Yeah, right. It's a, yeah. You pointed it out, I think, right, Jay? Okay, so uh, well, that's. So. So this is just in the last, I think, in the last year, from 2022. This is what the Conservation Fund put together. So we'll go over that quick. So the River Shore Trail work, uh, they replaced some failing bridges on the hiking and biking trails at $9,500. The Emerald Ash Borer Control, we spent $5,500 on that. Uh, there was a Bombardier Engineering Study uh, to improve parking options for river access at $625. The Beacon Preserve, uh, Riverside Bench, uh, we had 
a $300 allocation for a bench on that river shore trail. The Andrews Forest Trail Review uh, as part of the ecological study for new trails in Andrews Forest for $3,590 and a long-awaited project to rebuild the dam on Gillette Pond uh, for $150,000 and you'll see there that the total project cost of that is $700,000 and that's where Jay was talking about they do a pretty good job of matching, finding some matching funds so that's $150,000 contribution to a total $700,000 project that the land trust is funding through other sources in addition to the conservation fund. Thank you. Other questions on uh, Article 2? Anybody first time around? Yes ma'am, in the back. Denise Warner, I'd like to thank the select board for all the hard work that you've done on this budget and also the wonderful presentation. However, I am going to ask that we decrease the budget for, I think the number was roughly $50,000 for the amount of the sidewalk to go in front of the cemetery and in front of the, the former TD Bank building. I think that the people that lie in that cemetery have had enough to deal with with the Jolina project, as well as now making a new sidewalk in the front so of the Denise, cemetery. So Denise, before you go too much farther, are you, are you making this an amendment? To I am budget? making this an amendment to okay. decrease the budget for that project. I don't think it's in the budget. It's, right. it's not even in the budget. It's part of the reserve fund. So I mean, uh, stand by. There, there's a uh, Josh is looking up whether it's whether it's even in the budget versus a reserve fund. Right, right, right. That's a that's a reserve fund usage. Well, we're going to put money into the reserve fund to grow the new sidewalk. Good point. Okay. Right. So, thank you. So yes, um, there's. 16,250 that's in the in the planned use of reserves, which is not in the budget. And then, how much are we budget money? It was in. Thank you. Yeah. We have not yet voted on that project, have we? No. So that it would not be in the budget. It's it is a conversation. And there are many plans that were presented to us, but I don't believe that project has yet been voted on. <laughs> to complete that segment? From the reserve. Yeah. All right. So, so we we budgeted I think sixteen thousand five hundred to be spent out of the reserve, and then this is what's in the budget is a contribution to the sidewalk reserve fund of twenty five thousand dollars. That's what's in the budget. And that was a reduction. The twenty-five thousand was a reduction from the initial amount that was suggested, correct? And, and, and that is that. for all sidewalk projects. That is not. There is no link. One line. Yeah, there's not a line item that says we're going to put that that sidewalk in. Yes. Is there? There's a specific okay. line called new sidewalk. Reserve. Reserve. The other sidewalk line is oh, existing. Is, is, is existing reserve, so right. Mr. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, hang on, we're getting a little discussion here, so. Would you uh, like me to withdraw, uh, just a question, would you like me to withdraw my amendment to the budget, bring it up under other business, and have it vote, hopefully by paper ballot, that the project not continue? Well, that would be non-binding, but but because right now you could take it under advisement. Yeah. Okay. So, let me let me see if I can't take control back here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so forgive us. We're we're uh, the, the discussion that's going on here is whether or not there's an actual line item in the budget that that can be reduced that amount. So. Stand by just a second while our. Uh... Okay. 
you want me to give, yeah. you want me to try to give any more clarification? Yeah, give a little bit more clarification. <laughs> okay, I will try to summarize the last two and a half minutes of back and forth. Okay, so what is actually in the budget is $25,000 to go towards the new sidewalk reserve fund. So that is in the budget being voted on tonight. Should we put $25,000 into a new sidewalk reserve fund? That is not earmarked specifically for the sidewalk on Bridge Street. It could be for any new sidewalk in the budget. However, in the capital plan, we are looking at a uh, a use of $16,250 in FY24 to go towards that sidewalk. So that would come out of the new sidewalk reserve to go towards that specific sidewalk in the capital plan. Does that help? Clarify? I'm seeing some nods and hearing some no's. So it's a, it's a question of the capital plan, not the budget. I would, the actual use of it, yes, because all the budget allocates for is money to go into that reserve, and then it would be the select board with the guidance of the capital plan to fund that project. Uh, <laughs> the capital plan was approved by the board, yep. so that's a change in the capital plan, not the budget. Microsoft, please. Right. Microsoft. Yeah, sorry, that was, we're, we're, you know, I'll get it done. It's coming. We should start talking. <laughs> So that would mean a change in the capital plan, not a change in the budget. The, the budget has $25,000 going into that reserve, but the capital plan, which was approved by the board just a couple of weeks ago, that it would require a change in the capital plan. And that is, that is not a budget question. Okay, on page 22, planning, I see where it says new sidewalk reserve, Bridge Street, Phase one planning. So you're saying it does not include destroying the two green spaces and putting sidewalks in front of the cemetery, in front of the former TV bank. Is that correct? We need. And Mr. Moderator, while they're looking at it, so clarification. Um, yes. If it's not in a budget, I'll withdraw my motion. Explain to me how I get it across via yeah, well, people here. What's, what's, what's happening right now is we're 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 trying to clarify where that we're, we're trying to clarify where that money could come from. So so and you're uh, we, we recognize the fact that you're interested in decreasing the budget about amount, but I think the the clarity needs to come is where does that come from? It is coming from the reserve. So the capital, if you're looking at page 22, capital reserve expenditures, the plan is to spend 16250 on Bridge Street Phase 1 planning, new sidewalk, out of the new sidewalk reserve. So that is not necessarily the budget. The budget has a $25,000 contribution into the reserve. But you're talking about changing the capital plan, which you cannot. No. no. Well, that, that's what we're trying to advise the, the amendment here for. So, um, yes. I know. Hang on. We created a very. Unless there is an objection, we'll allow Connie to speak. This reserve was specifically created for the new sidewalk projects, phase one, phase two on Bridge Street, with possible other projects further down the line, which are not even part of the capital plan. So it does tie to the capital plan, because it's specifically being put into reserve for that Bridge Street sidewalk. Okay. So, with that explanation, Mrs. Barner, how would you like your amendment to try to read? Okay, if I'm understanding correctly, can you get her? Can you get her a microphone, please? So, Connie, your clarification—it is in the budget. So if you were going to vote something, you would vote to 
to change the $25,000 contribution If you're looking to change something in the budget, not the capital plan, you would want to change that $25,000 contribution going to the new sidewalk reserve. Because that money is for being spent on that project. However, Connie, clarification, I don't want to change the, um, the Bridge Street sign that's going to improve. Completely different. Okay. So yes, I'd like to amend my motion. Denise, I'd like to see that in writing, please. <laughs> and we have forms for that very purpose. No, no, Clint's got this. So, folks, um, I recognize the desire of what we want to do, but we're, we're going to um, stand by it because we've got to get this uh, piece of paper back to Mrs. Margaret. <coughs> yeah, you, you'd be looking to, Denise, you'd be looking to amend the bottom line. Of the total, to, you know, reduce the total budget by X, and then so the that, 16, as stated on page 22. Th then it would be up to the uh, select board in which to take that under advisement. And how are we going to do that? Right. So, okay, let's have a second. So, wait, what's this? The 16, I don't know. So, Denise, the 16250 on page 22. I'm going to pull it up. I think I've got it. Well, Denise is right. So, th so this one, the 16250, that's the planned expenditure from the reserve fund in this fiscal year for that sidewalk project. The um, the $25,000 that's in the budget is the planned contribution to that reserve fund. So the $25,000 is in the budget to go into that reserve fund. The planned use of $16,500 is in the capital plan. So I would like to uh, let you know that I sat down, this was probably a year or more ago, with Ben Kinnaman, the owner of Green Sea. His employees go between the building on the corner of Bridge Street and Route 2 and the building at Jolina Court. He specifically requested that something be done because all of his employees that have to walk back and forth because they also are parking down there, that in the dead of winter when we have four hours of sunlight, it's a dangerous walk because you're constantly crossing the road near a busy supermarket. And so that was a request from a business owner in town. And if, you know, I think that I understand what you're saying. The project, um, this, what's in here now is what's coming out of a reserve fund for a study for this section of the sidewalk. Doesn't mean it's going to be done. That reserve fund is also being set aside because there are many other sidewalks that have been proposed based on safety for pedestrians in our town. It includes sidewalks potentially up uh, from the school, up past um, South View, up all the way to Valley View. So what we're looking at doing is putting money aside so that we can implement a plan that we pay for to make pedestrian traffic, bicycle traffic safer in this town. So I understand that the issue is this one section of sidewalk. There are others in town who think this is a necessary um, addition to our town. Oh, and I just want to say you cannot say take this line item out of the budget. You can only reduce. You can only make a motion to reduce the budget by a particular amount of money. And that's what we're doing. Right, that's not that's just a Stand by. We're doing. We're doing that.
check it out. All right, let's see if we uh, can do some business here. <laughs> this is a uh, this is what I have in front of me as far as the amendment. And this, Bernard, I will ask you if this if this um, is sufficient what you're trying to do. I, Denise Barnard, move to amend the bottom line of the 2000 and FYI 2024 budget. Uh, to decrease, decrease it by $25,000 such that the amended full budget will now be $4,505,571. Does that, does that, is that what your, your intention was? Okay. Yes, sir. Do I have a second to the second. amendment? Second. There's a, there's a second to the amendment. Okay. So now, folks, from a parliamentary perspective, we are now uh, going to have a discussion upon this amendment. <coughs> so I will read it to you again, is that the, the amendment that has been duly seconded and is now on the floor in front of the voters is to decrease the FY 2024 budget by $25,000 such that the new figure for the budget will be four million five hundred five thousand dollars, four million five hundred five thousand five hundred seventy-one dollars. I will not entertain any discussion or questions upon the amendment, sir. You had your hand up, out back. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm G.C. Morris, and thank you, Ms. Houston, for answering one half of my question already. Um, the second half of that is, is there an excess of 16000 in the sidewalk reserve fund currently? Stay by with getting that answer, Mr. Morris. Donnie, can you play along with me? I, I think I've got the right answer here. So the sidewalk reserve fund at the end of FY22 was $10,000. And planned contributions in FY23 is $30,000. So we have no expenses in 23. So the, the, but the full amount will be $40,000 by the end of FY23 based on the contribution from last fiscal year and this fiscal year. Thank you. That's regardless of any change the amendment would make. And Ms. Heston has already clarified that that amendment would jeopardize future sidewalk projects, regardless of the section in front of the cemetery and the bank. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on the amendment? Morgan. Yes, sir, here in the center. Uh, Rick Barrett, if I understand what we've been saying here, by reducing the budget, I don't think we accomplish what Denise wants to do. Because we can't say, don't build that section of sidewalk. All we can do tonight is reduce the amount of money, which reduces the fund, which can jeopardize other projects that we want to do in the town. So if I understand correctly, and tell me if I'm wrong, by reducing the contribution to the fund, 
we have not done what Denise wants to do. Can someone tell me if that's correct or not? I believe, Rick, that is, that, that is correct. With you. It, 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 it is um, providing um, input and information to the select board. But. Testing. Um, it's not even actually doing that because, again, this money is a simple reduction to the bottom line of the budget overall. This has literally nothing to do with how it gets spent. It's advisory, as Clint has said, but we're not taking money away from sidewalks with this vote. We're literally just taking a certain amount of money from the final bottom line of the budget. Yes, sir, down here in the center. Uh, Morgan Wolliver. Um, I live in town off of Tilden Avenue and walk down to the, uh, the stores, uh, walk down to the post office, walk down to the park, and I couldn't tell you a number of times when walking past the uh, Cumby Farms or on the sidewalk that's along the retail now that you had time to end up out in the street. Uh, and I know a lot of people in the town would probably appreciate being able to cross the road and walk all the way down to the post office at least and avoid um, going to flashing lights because they're not necessarily safe. People are in a hurry. Uh, trucks uh, that are parked along Bridge Street, uh, obscure view of the vehicles coming back and forth. So this would be a great enhancement to the safety of kids and other people that, have, that enjoy walking in town, enjoy going to the store, and enjoy getting some exercise, and especially to young people. Thank you. Thank you. Up, up uh, top of the bleachers. My comment isn't, oops, sorry, Carol Bowdy. My comment isn't that I'm for or against the sidewalk issue. My comment is to remind the select board that this is the opportunity for the town people to try to give you a message that they want more communication and more input into major decisions like this. And that just a select board meeting or a transportation group coming up with what they think or a study, they want you to hear them. And the only way they have to have you hear them is to reduce your budget spending. Now I want to remind you all, there's $1.7 million in unallocated and restricted funds that could be used at any, at any time for the select board. So this is just a message you are trying to send. It's not going to hurt future sidewalks by reducing this by $25,000. Inflation right now says we should not be banking a lot of money we can go to bond for major votes in the future for a whole new sidewalk. It's more important for us right now to maintain the sidewalks we have and make sure we're improving the sidewalks we have, that we haven't improved some of them for over 10, 15, or more years. So this is an opportunity for the people in this community to tell you they want more input. And Denise's attempt to reduce the budget by $25,000 is insignificant when you have 1.7 million dollars that they can pull out of an account anytime they want. So I appreciate the message, I appreciate the attempt, I just tried to help her word her language but I wasn't trying to move this along. I just want you to hear the people in the audience. I know they go both ways but that this is their opportunity and the only way they have the opportunity to do anything with the budget is come before you and make a recommendation. So it's $25,000 is not going to be any impact on your budget because you have any un unassigned funds right now. Thank you. Um, I believe you had hand, your hand up here. Uh, go ahead. Well, just a comment. There's some folks up here pointing out that, and I think we pointed this out before, that the select board discussions as we prepare the budget and talk about these things are open public meetings. So in terms of when individual citizens have an opportunity to inform and influence the select board, it's at the public meetings that we hold. Um, they're more accessible than they were pre-COVID because now we are continuing hybrid meetings so you can participate from the comfort of your own home, arguably. Um, I'll also point out 
we're wrestling with the imperfect nature of this meeting. How many voters do we have in town? 141. 143,000. Check checklist? 378. So the checklist is 3,378 voters, and this evening apparently we have 141. Um, and some have left, but uh, you know, I wrestle with how people can contribute and participate. This is one vehicle, and it's what town meeting was designed for, to have exactly this kind of conversation. But I just point out that both the Transportation Committee and the Select Board meetings are open meetings and people can contribute or comment there. And that the vote on the budget at this point is somewhat imperfect. Uh, I sort of put to the next Select Board, whatever it will be, um, we'll have to wrestle with this. How do we get public input on this specific issue? And I know I've heard both sides of this in the past and again tonight on the specific sidewalk um, construction. Um, and I think that's one thing that the next chair and select board will have to wrestle with beyond tonight's meeting for with that. One more. Thank Just you. to add one more thing. Um, we know that the people who come to the select board meetings sit there going, when are they ever going to get to the topic I want to talk about? Um, we have to talk. You know, we're there till 11 o'clock some nights. However, it's not out of practice, it's not uncommon for us to warn a meeting that's primarily dedicated to a particular topic. One option that the future select board would have is to schedule a select board meeting with agenda item number one being sidewalk placement and location, and that would give everybody with a chance who wishes to weigh in a chance to come that night knowing it would be the first item on the agenda. I think warning that and making that meeting publicly known so that people who do feel one way or another, I think that would be a better option than just taking a certain small amount of money off the budget, which again, technically speaking, doesn't really accomplish anything. I think this should be, as Bard said, an item at a future select board meeting or at a transportation committee meeting or both because that's where we're going to get the most people contributing and give everybody a chance to weigh in. Thank you. Quickly. Um, so this is not a new issue and it has come up uh, several times in several different committees. Uh, one of the, uh, I think one of the uh, uh, brilliant committees that we have in town is the transportation committee. It's very well um, uh, staffed by volunteers that are very knowledgeable. Um, they have been meeting over the past two years, since March of 2021, uh, specifically uh, to create a bike and pedestrian plan that is quite extensive. It covers the entire town. It's 65 pages long. This project is in it. It's uh, well scoped. Uh, they have had numerous discussions on it. The other opportunity that, 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 that folks have to contribute is the Transportation Committee came to the Arthur Committee <coughs> to propose spending money on, there are two phases on Bridge Street. One phase is from Esplanade to the railroad, and the second phase is from the railroad to Route 2. Um, they have proposed spending ARPA money uh, on those two phases with the understanding that the first phase would be um, uh, would be a 80-20 a match, so the town would pay 20% of the cost uh, and the feds would pay 80, and the second piece would be funded entirely by uh, ARPA money, which the ARPA money is none of it is, is um, uh, town uh, uh, taxpayer money or not this taxpayer, property taxpayer money. That, that process, what that process would be, would be uh, first it would go through the ARPA committee, the ARPA committee would make recommendations to the select board, and then the select board would have uh, uh, the, the final say on how to spend that ARPA money. So it's a good issue. It's a good. It's an issue that I think that the, uh, the, the voters ought to think about and discuss. Um, one of the things that we found on the ARPA committee, one of the uh, top recommendations of the over, what, 500 suggestions that we had? Yep, I, I, I recognize that. I'll, yeah, let's, let's just Okay, well, um, uh, my only point is that we have, you have ample opportunity to provide input on this particular project um, uh, in various different uh, venues. Thank you. You had a question down here in the center? Hi, my name is Catherine Long. Um, over the years, I've had a particular interest in sidewalks, and I've attended 
I can't even tell you how many meetings about sidewalks with red dots and yellow dots and green dots and markers and all kinds of things. And I think it's really short-sighted to reduce the budget by this amount and take, you know, with the intent of taking the money out of sidewalk planning. And I think I agree with what's been said in terms of opportunities for input. Um, I've had ample opportunity to see um, documents online and um, I participated in an AARP sidewalk walkability uh, event where we walked around um, and I, I think it's just really a short-sighted amendment. I, well, I appreciate the intent and, and I realize that the geography in Richmond can sometimes complicate what we're doing with sidewalks, but uh, investing in sidewalks is um, typically something that's going to improve home values, make Richmond a more desirable place to live. And I'd like to call the question. Thank you. Um, the, the question has been called. Is there a second? A second. Thank you. Um, so once again, we're back to the calling of the question. So uh, it, we, again, it does require a two-thirds majority. So all those in favor of calling the question, please so, so signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Aye. The chair is not in question. The, uh, <laughs> Debate has ceased at this point in time, and we'll move right to the amendment. And let me remind you what the what we're voting on at the moment. The amendment is to decrease the FY 2024 budget by twenty-five thousand dollars, such that the full budget will now be $4,505,571. All those in favor of this amendment, please so signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no? No. The no's appear to have it. The no's do have it. Is there a challenge to the chair? The amendment has been defeated. We are now back to the original um, Article 2. I'd like to call the question on the budget. And, and uh, th thank you. Very excited about that. <laughs> All right. So, like, let, let me let me just let me just. I, I understand what you want to do, but we're, I, I want to restate the article so we know what we're calling the question on. Article 2 is shall the voters of the town of Richmond approve a budget of $4,530,571 to meet the expenses and liabilities of the town of Richmond. The question has been called. Is there a second to that? James Velasco, second. There is a, there's a second. All those in favor of calling the question, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The eyes have it, they appear to have it, the eyes do have it. And so um, we are now um, calling the question, which means there is no longer any debate on Article 2. So you are now ready for the question of Article 2, and I will repeat Article 2 again for you. Article 2, shall the voters of the town of Richmond approve a budget of $4,530,000 $571 to meet the expenses and liabilities of the town of Richmond. All those in favor of Article 2, please so signify by saying aye. Aye. And those opposed, no? No. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 2 has passed. Okay. Now, uh, we're continuing on the official warning. We are now at Article 3, which is to transact any other town business that may legally come before this meeting. Now I have a conundrum, folks, and you're gonna, I, I think I have a solution. This is typically the last article on the uh, agenda, uh, on the warning, but we do have um, Article 4 and 5 that um, are on Australian ballot, but as I indicated in my opening remarks, we do have the opportunity in which to discuss and ask questions about those. So, 
Unless there is an objection, I would um, ask us to move Article 3 to the end of the meeting, and we will skip right to Article 4. Is there any objections to that? Seeing none, we will go to Article 4. Now, recall, folks, that Article 4 is to be voted on by Australian ballot, which is tomorrow. Okay? Tomorrow from 7. Polls open at 7 a.m. So, again, state statutes back in 2008 indicate that we can have this discussion regarding Australian ballot items. So I will continue to do this. Shall, Article 4, shall the de general obligation bonds or notes of the town of Richmond in an aggregate amount, the aggregate amount not to exceed $1,900,000, subject to a reduction by available state and federal grants and aid and other financial assistance, to fund the replacement of water lines and a related approved tensions along the Tillon Avenue, approximately 1,305 linear feet, Along the portions of Cochrane Road, approximately 1,615 linear feet, and along a portion of Bridge Street, approximately 775 linear feet. I will entertain a motion in which to discuss Article 4. <coughs> motion has been to discuss it. Is there a second? The second. And we can now um, have a discussion on Article 4. And, and um, I, unless there is an objection, I will allow our town manager in which to give a, a short presentation, shorter than the last one. Uh, hearing no objections. There are none objections. I've always wanted to say, hearing none. Hearing none. Um, I, I promise this will not be as long as the budget presentation, but hopefully it will be just as informative. So Clint already went over the ballot item that is being voted on tomorrow, so I don't need to necessarily restate that. So the total project estimated cost is $1.9 million. That's for engineering and construction. A note that this is a water and sewer bond, and as such, it is the general obligation secured by the full pledge and full faith and credit of the town of Richmond, which means that it is backed by the entire grand list, voted on by the entire legal voters of the town of Richmond, but will be paid back by the water customers who will be paying rates to pay back the bond vote. This is to replace existing water lines, as we discussed on Tilden, Bridge Street, and portions of Cochrane Road. This is not to expand the current system, and this is unrelated to the expansion into the gateway. On Tilden Avenue, about 1,305 linear feet of pipe to be replaced. On Cochrane Road uh, and Bridge Street, sorry, on two portions of Cochrane Road and Bridge Street, the okay, let me, let me fast forward to the actual map. This is easier to understand. So you see Tilden Ave there highlighted in blue. The entirety of Tilden Ave will be replaced. The portion of Bridge Street is there just below the river. You can see that portion of Bridge Street from just below the bridge down to the intersection of Thompson Road. I'm going to zoom in on Cochrane because you can see that Cochrane has two sections. From the intersection uh, out to a break point, and then there's a small section where we've already replaced line recently, and there's a section at the end here as it goes out towards the cemetery. So a bit of a note about the Cochrane Road section, that piece that we're not replacing, that was replaced in the late 90s, there was some leaking there, so that section got replaced already with PVC pipe, so we are going to be skipping that section during this re uh, repair. So Tilden Ave has 8-inch diameter cast iron piping that was installed in the 1940s. Bridge Street has parallel 4-inch and 8-inch diameter asbestos cement pipes from the 1970s, and Cochrane Road has 8-inch asbestos cement for the majority of the replacement section. However, the last couple hundred feet is actually 2-inch PVC pipe from the 1990s. And that 2-inch PVC pipe services about three or four houses at the end of the line that you saw to be replaced. So this will replace the Bridge Street section with 12-inch C900 PVC and 8-inch C900 PVC on Cochrane and Tilden. The C900 PVC is the spec of pipe that we've been using for the last several water replacements over the last 10 years or so. Other components will replace hydrants, new isolation valves, copper water services, 
from the new bays to the edge of the town right of way, restoration of pavement, sidewalk, and lawn areas at the conclusion of the project. Actually, one more note on the Cochran Road portion. So the two-inch section will be replaced by eight-inch pipe. That will essentially allow for fire protection to be taken to the end of the line. Right now, there's a hydrant before it necks down to two inches. There will be a new hydrant installed at the far end of that line just to increase fire protection because now we're able to upgrade to eight inch and you need eight inch to have fire protection for a fire hydrant. So this project is on the drinking water state revolving fund priority list, which means that it is eligible and in line for a 50% subsidy on the cost. That has not been finalized yet. It will be finalized in the midsummer of 2023. Uh, assuming that this project makes the list and makes the cuts officially in the summer of 2023, that means that we will have a 50% forgiveness on the project, on whatever the total cost ends up being, as well as a zero interest loan for that cost. At a 40 year payback with 50% forgiveness on the total cost of the project, at 0% interest, the bond payment would be $23,750. So again, that's at 50% of the cost, so that's assuming we get the grant at 50% and a zero interest bond payback. If the town does not receive the 50% forgiveness from DWSRF, the Water and Sewer Commission may consider not moving forward with the project until 50% forgiveness could be obtained for the project. However, it is very likely we will receive that, that forgiveness. The timeline looks like this. We have a bond vote tomorrow, should that pass. In the summer and fall of 2023, we'll proceed with the grant and loan applications, final engineering, and bid preparation. In the winter of 2024, this would be out to bid for construction, and then construction would occur in the spring, summer, or fall of 2024. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Are there, are there questions for the... Uh Town manager on his presentation. Yes, sir. Can you just clarify, uh, Pete Halverson? Can you clarify that the current uh, repayment projects that are planned in the budget are those separate, or that that money is included in part of this project? Oh, for repayment, right? So the repayment specified in the project would be just to patch. Where the, where the damage, where the road was cut to replace the water line, and then Pete would have a repaving pro, a, would fully repave each of those roads, and he sort of timed out the repaving of these roads knowing these projects are coming. So they'll be initially packed after the project, that's part of the plan, and then in the next year or so, we have a plan to repave the entire road. Thank you. Question in the... Uh, Brian Carpenter. Um, regarding the paving or the patching as you call it um, down bridge street it's still atrocious it was bad the day they put it in and I'm, i would be inclined to not vote for this just based on what the road was left like at the end of the day thank you so we know that i mean on bridge street um i understand there's concerns your concerns with the quality of how they left it at the end of was that two summers ago now project um, and we do have a plan to repave Bridge Street this coming spring, uh, at least that section. So um, we did know that while we were doing this, that next phase was going to be coming. Um, we also usually try to get these paving projects done earlier in the season. That project, I believe, we were it, was, it went into late November, early December. Um, so the paving um, potentially could have been better. We did sign off on it that it was complete, knowing that we were going to be repaving the whole Bridge Street road uh, in the next year or so. Thank you. Any other questions on presentation or on Article 4? Uh, yes, sir, in the back. <coughs> My name is Tracy Morris. Uh, this is oblique, but that section on Cochrane Road, does that also have sewer lines that may need to have pavement repaired on top once those extensions happen? Uh, years ago, I understood that it was only potable water that ran at the extremity of that line. 
this is just water. Yeah, this is his question is are there sewer lines there? I believe there are sewer lines run out there because they would have to have sewer if they have water. I don't I don't know I don't know the specific. I think they do have sewer. And I don't know the condition of those. Does anybody on the commission know yeah, that? Yeah, the sewer lines are there. They were put in in the late 90s, so they're good. David, go sewer lines are good. <laughs> <laughs> what Linda said. <laughs> what did Linda say? <laughs> I said that I just took David's words and said the sewer lines are good there. We're not sure how far the sewer lines extend, uh, but that section was put in very recently, so those lines, if they're there, are in good shape. Some of the areas sewer I have one, one comment um, as a resident of Tilden Avenue. One of the things you'll note if you go down Tilden Avenue, you see a spot where the pavement is missing because of a leak from the 1940s vintage pipe. So one of the things I just observed is for these older pipes, the replacement is, is disruptive to the pavement, but frankly not as disruptive to the pavement as the leaks. Um, when we have a leak in that kind of arrangement, I don't think we've seen the bill yet, but we could anticipate the cost of that weekend cold weather leak of being somewhere in the neighborhood of $25,000 and left without pavement covering the leak. So part of this is the long-term plan of both the pipes and the pavement, if that makes sense. Just to add to one other thing, um, the Tilton Avenue pipe, you know, it's 1940s era iron, it's in terrible shape. But a lot of the uh, lines leading from that line to people's houses are of similar vintage. And we do anticipate working with the homeowners along these stretches to make sure that those they have the opportunity, while we're digging down anyway, to make sure those lines to their houses are also replaced. So we're not patching the line and leaving the connections in, in, in bad shape. <laughs> Any other questions, comments on the presentation? Seeing none, I will, uh, whoop, do we have one? Yes, in the back. Raise your hand high, there we go. I'm not sure if the next step is that people will be voting on this. Uh, no, I, again, this is on my Australian okay, ballot, so it will be done tomorrow, but this is our chance in which to uh, become more informed. Yeah, good. Okay, thank you. Anything else on this article, Article 4? Seeing none, I'll take a motion in which to cease discussion. Um, Can I have a second? Second. Okay. The... Uh, Discussion has ceased on Article 4. Uh, Article 5, shall the voters, shall the voters to approve funding the Conservation Reserve Fund by adding one cent to the municipal tax rate in the 2023-2024 fiscal year. Again, this is voted on tomorrow by Australian ballot, but this is our chance in which to ask any questions. I know some of this was covered during the budget discussion, but I would entertain a motion if anyone would like to discuss Article 5 any further. James Velasky, I make a motion to hold discussion on Article 5. So, um, okay, the motion to have a discussion has been made. Is there a second? Yeah. A second. Uh, it's um, been moved and seconded. Um, so Article 5, shall the voters to approve funding for the Conservation Reserve Fund by adding one cent to the municipal tax rate in the 2023-2024 fiscal year. It is now um, on the floor for discussion. Um, any, any questions about Article 5 um, that can be answered here by the Assembly? Yes, sir. 
I be however saying again, is there a, a, a list, Joss, or anticipation of projects that um, currently were pending for the conservation fund? Is there a need for, for additional um, reserve? Dan. Yeah. 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 Well, so that, I think he's asking about like what's not on the list that we reviewed earlier. You've already, already completed those projects. Yeah, right, right. or they've already been assigned funding. I don't, I'm not aware of a list of pending projects. They usually sort of come up from requests that go to the Conservation Commission and come to the Select Board. If there's anybody from the Conservation Commission who is in attendance or has a different understanding, or if any of the board members do, please uh, jump in. Anybody want to speak to that? In, in the back? Thank you, uh, Brad Elliott, again. Um, I'm not on the Conservation Commission, but I was just reading the um, information sheet on this that they distributed. And, and right now, there's the only thing up, uh, that they know about, I mean, something could come in tomorrow, um, is uh, some, um, some kind of improvement to Volunteer Green. I'm not sure exactly what those are. John, would you know? Is he still here? John Card? No, I don't know. That's, that's all I know is what it said on the information sheet that something's going on at Volunteer Green. But the deal is, the beauty of that fund is that it's there that a lot of times these opportunities arrive, you know, out of the blue almost, and it gives the town the flexibility to uh, act on them, to review them, um, give them to the select board, and act without having to wait for, you know, the, the following year's uh, budget vote. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other discussion on Article 5? Morgan. Uh, here in the front, right in the middle. Hi, uh, Josh, would you just repeat again about how much that adds to uh, each house uh, in the uh, taxes? Thank you. Yeah, it, it's. Ten dollars per hundred thousand dollars property value. Thank you. Any other questions on Article Five? All the way to the back, back corner. Nope. You think? Way back. There you go. Way over there. Hi, uh, Paul Hoff. Has there been any consideration to make that conservation contribution a set amount or a percentage? Um, given that uh, we're going through a um, adjustment to the, to the grand list, that could be a pretty big bump that we don't know about. It's 48000 as per previous, but I'm guessing that the value of the grand list is going to go up significantly. So this has no... No, this has nothing to do with the grand list. Well, so... I, so I, I haven't been... You know, any, I don't think there's any, any discussion at the select board level about if this should be a set amount versus a percentage. I think it's been a percentage for a number of years, and the request again is for that same percentage. Um, I do understand your point, though, that if the grant list goes up by, say, 20%, we're going to be adding $10,000 to that request, roughly, um, because it, it's based on a percentage of the grant list. But as of right now, that's the way the question is stated for tomorrow, and. We can't change it right now. But we could vote on it again next year. Right, we could vote on it again next year. Um, they have to vote on it. Yeah, it has to be voted on every year if, it, if, if we want to consider funding it. Um, so if it went down tomorrow, it could come back again next year. It would just mean a year without funding. But I understand your point. If the grand list could go up significantly, and right now we don't know what that price is going to be. Thank you. Question in the back. Amanda Kirthy again. It, um, this is the same exact fund, though, that it just passed at a three point something percent increase in the town budget? Or is it a different fund? Can you clarify that? Yeah, sure. So the budget as presented does not include the conservation reserve fund. So that 3.67 is the estimated increase in the tax rate from FY23 to FY24 without the conservation reserve fund. If the Conservation Reserve Fund passes, everybody's taxes will essentially go up by $10 per 100000 
So then that 3.7% increase would increase because this would then be funded. So because what just passed did not include the conservation measure fund. Thank you for bringing that up. It does get good, tricky. Good, good clarification, indeed. Any other questions on Article 5? Okay, sounds like we're an informed group. So, oh, uh, for a second time around, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, Amanda, can we begin? Okay, so you had just made some comment that every year this gets voted on, this is the only way that this fund gets money in its bank. Correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good. Any other discussion? Seeing none, I will accept a motion in which to cease discussion. Moved, seconded, seconded. Thank you. Okay, continuing on the warning. Oh my goodness, we're at the last article. Uh, this is uh, traditionally uh, Article 3, which we moved to the end. It states, to transact any other town business that may legally come before this meeting. Um, again, this is, a, this is a, traditionally the last article, this is a non-binding um, um, resolutions and <coughs> things that can come up. It's non-binding because it hasn't been worn, but this is typically where announcements or those type of things will be made. Um, and I know our town clerk has a couple of uh, items under Article 3 in which to talk. Thank you. As probably most people know, um, a Richmond family uh, has lost use of their home. Uh, the fire department's involved, did an excellent save. They are going to have to probably, you know, rebuild a good share of the house, but a lot of it was smoke damage and water damage. Um, the fire, as I understand, completely took out two, part, two uh, rooms of their house. And I understand they're having a GoFundMe page, but some people are not comfortable doing that. So we have consented to take donations. If anybody would like to give a check um, to Ron and Angela Mack, they can leave it off at the town clerk's office. We have a, a collection point there. Either bring it in the office or put it in the town center drop box and we'll <laughs> see that the Macks get that. It's, uh, it's the husband and wife and two teenagers. And besides losing everything, they lost three pets. So they are quite devastated. They're all staying in one motel room, a single room for all of that. And if anybody has any ideas of some place they could rent, because it's probably going to be six to nine months before they can move back in, uh, you can let me know and I'll pass it on. And the second announcement I have is that there will be a rabies clinic this year. It'll be March 18th, 9 till noon at the Huntington Fire Station. And you can go on the Huntington Town website and make a res uh, appointment if you'd like. It's $20 per animal, and every dog and cat should have their baby shot. Thank you. Um, I believe the Richmond Fire Department has a... Uh, Announcement or a presentation? Yeah, can we have the microphone there? Thank you. Boy, what a mistake giving me a microphone. Please state your name. Michael Parrott um, with the fire department. As some people know, but apparently some people don't, and I hope they're able to watch later on the cable. Uh, our town clerk, Linda Parent, this year was voted Town Clerk of the Year for the State of Vermont. <laughs> and for all the work she's done for the town, and for the fire department helping us with everything we've needed, we'd like to present her with these flowers. Aww. 
Do we have any words from Linda? She does. The elections uh, account is going to buy some more microphones so that we all have enough. <laughs> uh, thank you very much from the fire department. Um, it's my distinct pleasure um, serving the town of Richmond, and I'm very happy to say all of our departments work very well together, and the select board um, works well with all of us, and that's not always the case in some towns in Vermont. So I'm very proud to say I'm from Richmond. Thank you. I don't know. Okay. I just like to share. I had the fortune to be present when Linda got this award at the Town Clerks Association. Um, she responded much better this time when she got the award. The first time, she almost fell over. <laughs> it was. It was. She was well deserved, and we are very lucky to have her. I would like to say one other thing, real quick, while I've got the mic. Um, we are all very grateful. I know. I speak for everybody in town for our first responders, our police, our fire, our rescue squad. Um, I just would like to call out Jerry Levesque, who we just heard about the, the Max almost losing their home. If it weren't for Jerry being Johnny on the spot, they probably would have. And we are very fortunate that we have people like him who can drop whatever they're doing and come and, and save property, save lives. And I think every, all of our first responders, police, rescue, and fire deserve our thanks and a big round of applause. under Article 3, I'll go all the way in the back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Marshall Paulson, and I don't know if we're making history tonight by being the first time we're having a town meeting on a Monday evening versus our traditional Tuesday. I think this is the first time in 228 years. Yeah. Well, tonight I would like to speak to breaking with our new one-night tradition. Um, over this last year, I think I'm not alone in that many folks have heard a desire to have our town meeting go back to Tuesday as it has traditionally. And on that behalf, there are a number of folks this evening who will have uh, clipboards with petitions. And if you're interested in having town meeting to go back to Tuesday, the process would be you will vote on that by Australian ballot, and the petition is to get the question on the ballot in November's election to return town meetings to Tuesdays. So as you're leaving this evening, please see one of the folks here who has um, clipboards and petitions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Up in the bleachers. Gary Bressart here. So I had an idea of how to adjust the voting a little bit, whether it's we go back to uh, Tuesday town meetings or we do it the way we we're doing it tonight, which is on the uh, budget vote that after we do all the amendments, if we do any amendments, uh, we call for a paper ballot and call for a paper ballot that stays open and is not counted until the end of the polling on the Australian ballot. I don't know if that would take a charter change, but it would, would retain the right of the people that come to the meeting to make amendments up or down. And at that point, whatever that number is, people that come in for the Australian ballot vote would get a separate yes or no vote, paper ballot, not an Australian ballot. And they would vote, they would know what that number was that was passed at the meeting, and they could vote up or down on that number. So uh, it's not an Australian ballot vote because Australian ballot are pre-printed ballots that have the number on it. And to do that takes away the right of the meeting to adjust the number. So it's just an idea. I would encourage the select board to 
see if it even takes a charter change, and if it does take a charter change, whether that's a big deal or not, or whether they don't even like the idea. I don't know. Just an idea. Thank you. Anything, any other business under Article 3? All the way in the back. Um, John Cart, uh, I just want to say uh, again, thank you to the Select Board for another year of not just your regular meetings, but special meetings and extra meetings, and in particular to Jim and Heston for another term uh, coming back to the Select Board. Uh, thank you all for your work and the many, many hours that you've put in on behalf of our town. Thank you. Right up front, did you have a... Uh, John took care of it. John took care of it, okay. Any other uh, items under Article 3? Okay, um, I do have a, a couple uh, before we get to, I know everybody's looking to scoot out of here, but I uh, wanted to thank Troop 23, uh, the young men that uh, helped set this whole place up. And, uh, it's, uh, wonderful to see them. I know they're here probably for citizenship in the community mayor badge, but uh, regardless of that, uh, it's good to have young people in, in our midst. Uh, and before I uh, get my last, uh, uh, before I strike the gavel, and uh, all of you folks, thanks for coming out tonight, but uh, we would like some help picking up here a little bit. If you could help with your chairs and that type of thing, people will be around and wish to help that, um, with that. Okay, seeing any other, nothing else, then uh, it's been an honor to facilitate this meeting. Uh, tonight, I appreciate all of your uh, patience as we uh, walk through all this. And having completed all the warned articles for this town meeting, I would like to ask for a motion to adjourn. I have a motion to out back. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of adjournment, please so signify by saying aye. Aye. Anyone opposed, say nay. Wow, unanimous. Have a good night, folks.